the whitest ring? To give to Jen. Oh, I was wondering what it was. There's an emery hat, but it was my, like my brother came in with my mother. That's he fine. Took, you got, you got, you got four years to make it up to me. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's a very good evening, everyone. If I could ask you all to quiet down for a moment. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's one of the special nights in this room, and we're all incredibly excited to be here tonight. So let's begin. Tonight is the Village Council regular public meeting. The date is April 10th, 2024. The time is 7.30. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled the same as provided by law of a schedule, including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Here. Council Member Reynolds. Here. Council Member Weitz. Here. Council Member Winograd. Here. And Mayor Vagianos. Here. Will you all please join us in a salute to our flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I move that the bills, claims, and vouchers and statement of funds on hand as of March 30, 31st, 2024 be accepted as submitted. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. Vagianos? Yes. And we're going to go right to our proclamations, but we're going to take them slightly out of order. So we're going to begin with the proclamation of Tree Planting Month. Siobhan, would you take that one, please? Sure. Whereas the village of Ridgewood is proud of its many trees, which contribute so much to the beauty and comfortable ambience of the village, and whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cutting heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for our wildlife. And whereas trees in our village increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of the business area, and beautify our community. Whereas Arbor Day is now observed through the nation and the world in recognition of the importance of trees. And whereas the village of Ridgewood has been recognized as a tree city USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation for its extensive plantings and its program for the maintenance of trees. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood does hereby proclaim April 2024 as Tree Planting Month in the Village of Ridgewood and April 26, 2024 as Arbor Day and urges all residents to plant trees to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and support our village's urban forest aid program. And additionally, pick up your free sapling at Earth Day in Van Ness Park from our Shade Tree Division. Thank you, Siobhan. And then we have a proclamation for National Drinking Water Week. Pam? Thank you. Whereas water is our most valuable natural resource, and whereas drinking water serves a vital role in daily life, serving an essential purpose to health, hydration, and hygiene, needs for the quality of our 
of life our citizens enjoy. And whereas only tap water delivers public health protection, fire protection, support for our economy, and the quality of life we enjoy. And whereas the hard work performed by the entire water sector, designing capital projects, operators ensuring the safety and quality of drinking water, or a member of a pipe crew maintaining the infrastructure communities rely on to transport high quality drinking water from its source to consumers' taps. And whereas any measures of a successful society, low mortality rates, economic growth and diversity, productivity and public safety are in some way related to access to safe water. And whereas we are all stewards of the water infrastructure upon which future generations depend, and whereas each citizen of our village is called upon to help protect our source waters from pollution, to practice water conservation, and to get involved in local water issues by getting to know their water. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood does hereby proclaim May 5th through 11th, 2024, as National Drinking Water Week in the Village of Ridgewood. Thank you, Pam. And we now have a proclamation for Building Safety Month. Evan? Where is our village continuing effort to address the critical issue of safety, energy efficiency, water conservation, and resilience in, this, in the built environment that affect our citizens, both in everyday life and in times of natural disaster, give us confidence that our homes, buildings, and infrastructures are safe and sound. And whereas our confidence is achieved through the devotion of vigilant guardians, building safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, laborers, and others in the construction industry who work year-round to ensure the safe construction of buildings. And whereas these guardians, dedicated members of the International Code Council, use a governmental consensus process that brings together local, state, and federal officials with expertise in the built environment to create and implement the highest quality codes to protect Americans in the buildings where we live, learn, work, worship, and play. And whereas the international codes, the most widely adopted building safety, energy, and fire prevention codes in the nation, are used by most U.S. cities, counties, and states. These modern building codes also include safeguards to protect the public from natural disasters such as hurricanes, snowstorms, tornadoes, wild land fires, floods, and earthquakes. And whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind the public about the critical role our community's largely unknown guardians of public safety, our local code officials, who assure us of safe, efficient, and livable buildings. And whereas Mission Possible, the theme for Building Safety Month 2024, encourages us all to raise awareness about building safety on a personal, local, and global scale. And whereas Building Safety Month 2024 strives to ensure that the places where we live, learn, work, worship, and play are safe and sustainable, and recognize that, counties, that countless lives have been saved due to the implementation of safety codes by local and state agencies. And whereas each year in observation of Building Safety Month, Americans are asked to consider projects to improve building safety and sustainability at home and in the community, and to acknowledge the essential services provided to all of us by local and state building departments, fire prevention bureaus, and federal agencies in protecting lives and property. Now for be it resolved that the Village Council of the Village Ridgewood does hereby proclaim May 2024 as Building Safety Month and encourages all residents to join in participation in Building Safety Month activities. Thanks, Evan. And now we're going to have a proclamation for Older Americans Month. Lorraine. Thank you. Whereas the Village of Ridgewood includes a growing number of older Americans who contribute their time, <clears throat> wisdom, and experience to our community. And whereas the Village of Ridgewood benefits when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds have the opportunity to participate and live independently. And whereas the Village of Ridgewood recognizes our need to create a community that offers the services and supports older adults may need to make choices about how they age. And whereas the 2024 theme is powered by connection, which recognizes the profound impact of meaningful relationships and social connections on the health and well-being of older adults and explores the vital role that connectedness plays in supporting independence and aging in place by combating isolation, loneliness, and other issues. And whereas the Village of Ridgewood can promote the benefits of connecting with older Americans by sharing facts about the mental, physical, and emotional health benefits of social connection, promoting resources that help older adults engage, like community events, social clubs, and volunteer opportunities.
connecting older adults with local services such as transporta transportation that can help overcome obstacles to achieving or maintaining meaningful relationships. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood does hereby proclaim May 2024 as Older Americans Month and calls upon residents to join in recognizing the contributions of our older citizens and promoting programs and activities that foster connection, inclusion, and support for older adults. Thanks, Lorraine. And now we have a resolution for Slow Mo May. Pam? Thank you. Whereas pollinating insects serve a significant and critical role in propagating the food chain and their ideal habitat is one comprised of mostly native wildflowers, flowering grasses, plants, shrubs, and trees. And whereas Slow Mo May is a community initiative that encourages property owners to reduce the frequency with which they mow their lawn during the month of May to provide early season foraging resources for pollinators that emerge in the spring, especially in our suburban landscapes when few floral resources are available. And whereas research has shown a significant increase in both abundance and species richness of butterflies and bees in less frequently mown lawns, and that a two-week mowing regime supports the highest bee abundance. Whereas the village of Ridgewood would like to encourage interested residents to increase pollinator-friendly habitat by encouraging pollinator-friendly lawn care practices on their own properties, now therefore be it resolved that the village of Ridgewood does hereby proclaim Slow Mo May to actively promote and educate the community about the critical period of pollinator emergence generation of crucial pollinator supporting habitat and early spring foraging opportunities. And be it further proclaimed that the, village, that the Village of Ridgewood encourages village residents to participate in the Slow Mo May program, voluntarily slowing their lawn care until June, which will allow pollinator species to emerge and early flowering grasses to establish. Thanks, Pam. We have one more proclamation, and we're all going to come down there to do this one. This is one of the nicer nights that we'll ever spend in this room. And I'm gonna ask Rich Brooks and his entire family to come up and join us, if you would. Also, Stacey Antine and Julia Buckley, will you come and join us right over here? Rich? Rich? Come on over. So, for those of you who are unaware, Rich Brooks is the chair of the Parks and Recreation Conservation Board. And on January 23rd, near the end of the meeting, he collapsed and suffered a massive heart failure. And his heart stopped beating for 35 minutes. He was shocked seven times. And he is standing with us today because the people in the room took all the right actions, jumped into the fray, and truly saved his life. And it was a monumental effort by many, many, many people. Most or all of them are in the room tonight. And so I'm going to read this proclamation and We read lots of proclamations, as you can see. This one is very personal for me because this man and this woman have been my personal best friends for over 35 years. So 
Whereas Richard Brooks has been a dedicated and tireless volunteer in the village of Ridgewood, coaching lacrosse and soccer at Ridgewood High School, serving on the boards of the American Red Cross, the March of Dimes, and Ridgewood's Parks and Recreation and Conservation Board for decades, most recently as the chair of the PRC Board. And whereas on January 23rd, 2024, while serving at a PRC Board meeting, Richard Brooks suffered a heart attack. And whereas both Stacy Antine and Julia Buck Buckley, who were in attendance at the PRC Board meeting, were nothing short of heroic in beginning CPR compressions on Mr. Brooks and continued to do so until the fire department engine 31 crew and EMTs arrived on the scene. And whereas there were many who banded together to save this one life, as PRC board member Victoria Van Dyke called 911, gave direction and delivered verbal commands, and fire engine 31 crew Fire Lieutenant Jordan Zales, Firefighter Matthew Musicant, Firefighter Chris Mead, EMT, and Firefighter Matthew Bombase, Ambulance 46, along with Dr. Robert Lajita, the medical director for the ambulance group, responded quickly to the 911 call. And whereas Deputy Mayor Pamela Perrin called Fire Chief John Judge, and she shared verbal CPR commands from Chief Judge. And whereas other members of the PRC board in attendance, David Sales, Liz Cloak, Jim Morgan, Board of Education Representative Mary McCauley, Dina Catt of the Parks Division, and Nancy Bigos, Director of Parks and Recreation, lent moral support and other assistance where needed. And whereas police officer Shane Broglia and police officer Andrew Van Dyke responded to the call and assisted the Fire Engine 31 crew and EMTs by retrieving equipment as necessary. And whereas once at Valley Hospital, doctors and nurses continued to keep Richard Brooks' heart pumping and were able to get his heart to beat on its own after 35 minutes of CPR compressions. Now, therefore, be it resolved, that the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood extends their appreciation and thanks to all who participated in this life-saving effort, especially Stacy Antine and Julia Buckley, whose quick action in initially administering CPR allowed Richard Brooks to survive his heart attack, return to the PRC Board's March meeting, and join us here this evening. And be it further resolved that the Village Council wishes Richard Brooks many more years of good health and time spent enjoying his family and friends. Thank you. Before we begin taking pictures, I want to tell you something that the cardiologist told Gail, Rich's wife. He said, people do not survive this. There is no reason why he survived. He said, when she asked how, he said it was absolutely divine intervention. I present to you the people who are doing God's work. They are divine intervention. Okay. <laughs> 
I just want to say that um, I really value the EMS and fire department because this is, I always wanted to be one, but it was so stressful, I thought, well, and I'd never done CPR except on a mannequin, it was my first time, but I just love Rich and when it happened, we all embraced it and um, we just needed to be, do what was done. I mean, most people sometimes don't do what they need to do, but um, I couldn't think of anything better when I walked in the room and saw his smiling face. And I'm just so grateful that he's here with us today. So thank you. Um, similar to Stacy, I just have such an appreciation for our emergency responders being in that position and having to do it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Once is enough for me, <laughs> um, but I'm so grateful tonight to walk back into this room and see this healthy man and re-meet him. That was my first time really meeting him at that meeting. That was my first Parks and Recreation Board meeting, so it was <laughs> quite an introduction to my service for this town. Um, but I'm so happy that to re-meet him this evening and see his wonderful family, and thank you all for this night. And as Julia said, this was her very first meeting, and yet she came back for a second one. <laughs> um, and Stacy was only there because she was making a special presentation, which she was supposed to make in October, but didn't work out. Supposed to make in November, didn't work out. December meetings canceled. So she happened to be there in January. If that's not divine intervention, I don't know what is. And now I give you my friend, Rich Brooks. Well, I guess, I guess this is one of those moments that you really don't want to relive. Um, on the other hand, it was a great first meeting. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't say enough about the people um, up here. And on behalf of my family, my wife Gail, my daughter Mackenzie, my son Ryan, my beautiful granddaughter Gemma, who turns one next week. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. As fixed as it is, and it's pretty fixed. <laughs> I have a lot of hardware inside, but it all works, and I'm thrilled to death to be here, as you can imagine. Um, the doctors did tell me basically what they told Gail and Paul. Um, there's no reason for me to be around. Um, they gave a lot of credit to not only the humans involved, but this machine that I'm learning about, the Lucas machine, which I don't even know what it looks like, but I'm going to find out. That's, not only did it save my life, but most importantly, I survived with all my brain function. Um, being down so long really doesn't lead to a positive outcome for uh, brain damage. I had none. I remember the things that I want to remember. I did re remember one thing. Tomorrow is my 34th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and hopefully she'll stick around with me for another 34. But I am truly blessed to have, to, first of all, to live in this town. I'm truly blessed to be surrounded by people who are smart, active, and willing to put it to practice. I will say this, everybody should learn CPR. Everybody should learn CPR. Because you may need it someday. You may need it for a parent or a friend or just the chairman of the board, of the committee that you're serving on. But it's very important. I learned it because I coach. It's not something that you want to use, but you're glad you have it in your back pocket in case you have to pull it out. But thank you very much. Thank you to the council. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, Paul. And thank all of you.
Remember what Rich said. Let's all get out there and learn CPR. I know CPR. She knows CPR. Let's, and she does now too. She, she learned on the job training. So let's all, let's all do this. Let's make this our commitment going forward. We have already expanded um, purchasing more um, uh, electric defibrillators known as AEDs and there is now one at the health barn where this took place. And so this is going to be a movement that we hope will reverberate beyond our community. Thank you all so much tonight. Okay, we're good. Oh no, we can take, oh no, we'll take pictures. Now we'll take pictures. Now we'll take, I forgot the pictures. I forgot the pictures. She should be in the front. I'm serious, she should definitely be in the front. And now we have more good stuff. And that was nice. But now we have more we have more nice stuff. I'd like to call up Fire Lieutenant Gregory Corcoran and his family. I don't play. I don't. 
blame you. You hold it with mommy, okay? Okay, and now we get to do more fun stuff. If you guys will all, thank you so much. You ready? If you'll repeat after me. I, Gregory Corcoran, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will faithfully. And I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform all of the duties. And justly perform all of the duties. Of the office of fire lieutenant. Of the office of fire lieutenant. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. What's that? What's the line? Next up, Volunteer Fire Lieutenant Jeffrey Cregan and your family, will you please come and join us? Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Jeffrey Cregan. I, Jeffrey Cregan. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will faithfully. And that I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform all of the duties and justly perform all of the duties of the office of fire lieutenant of the office of fire lieutenant according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability so help me god so help me god congratulations Now I'd like to call up an old friend, Captain Robert Peacock, and his family. If you'll repeat after me. I, Robert Peacock. I, Robert Peacock. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform all of the duties. And justly perform all the duties of the office of fire lieutenant of the office of fire captain <laughs> misprint <laughs> of the office of fire captain office of fire captain according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability so help me god so help me god congratulations
And now we're going to get on to less important things. And before we continue, I don't think so. I got one right here. Before we continue, I want to spend send out a very special thank you and warm wishes to our village clerk, Heather Malander. Heather had an emergency appendectomy a couple of weeks ago, and so she will not be returning until probably next week. So we all wish her a quick recovery, but just as importantly, I want to point out the type of dedication she has. She is the person who drafts all of the proclamations and she drafted the proclamations that were read this evening from home while she is recovering from surgery. So again, a very special shout out to our good friend Heather. We need you back soon. Please hurry back. And now we will go to comments from the public. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. It is now spring, and along with the many joys of the season comes the application of dangerous pesticides by landscape companies as well as businesses that specialize in insecticide treatments. Many companies apply pesticides via fogging to the lawns, trees, and shrubs of their clients. The technicians who do so usually wear full respirators and often protective jumpsuits. This can happen as often as monthly throughout the spring, summer, and into the fall. The disclaimers and warnings about these po poisons regarding skin and eye contact as well as inhalation risks are frankly alarming. They are, after all, poisonous chemicals. No, no, no. Excuse me, Ann, just a moment. Tony, we have to leave the door open. Thank you. Um, Frank's going to go out and ask the people to just be a little quieter. It's okay. Yeah, we've all we've all made that move. So. <laughs> and let's make sure Ann gets some extra time. Yeah, we should stop the clock or give her back the 30 seconds. We'll make sure. Okay, Ann, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> the disclaimers and warnings about these poisons regarding skin and eye contact as well as inhalation risks are frankly alarming. They are, after all, poisonous chemicals. As always with such matters, the risks increase for those who have respiratory disorders, are elderly, or are otherwise compromised. Repeated exposures amplify the negative effects. Homeowners who contract with these companies are given advance notice of upcoming applications so they can close their windows, go indoors, and bring children and pets inside for a few hours. Their neighbors are not given such notice. In recent years, Dawn Citrullo has posted an announcement on the Village webpage informing residents of the dangers of inhaling these chemicals and of everyone's right by law to be informed when a fogging is going to take place in their neighborhood explaining how to access the DEP website in which the legislation is explained in detail. And she also offered safe alternatives to deterring insects when you are outdoors. This no longer appears on our new webpage, so I am hoping the manager will direct the health department to put it up front once again this spring and summer. I gave a paper copy um, of the announcement to Dawn before the meeting. 
As a side note, Mr. Gruenhagen of the DEP explained to me that these chemical applications are basically useless unless you're having an outdoor gathering or a party a few hours after the fogging. He also explained that the damage to birds and animals who cannot hide indoors can be significant. Mr. Gruenhagen said that a fan is one of the most effective ways to keep mosquitoes and other insects from bothering people as they sit outside and enjoy a cookout, read a book, or take a snooze. This method, the fan, is obviously risk-free. So again, I gave uh, Dawn's flyer to Dawn, and uh, if, I think she said she has an electronic copy. So hopefully the manager will allow that to be posted. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elizabeth Burke. Um, I'm at 377 Hopper. I am the direct backyard neighbor of Ann. Elizabeth, uh, if you could speak more directly into the mic. Sure. Can thank you, you hear me better now? Much better. Great. Thank you. Uh, I am here for the first time, excited to live in New Jersey. Um, and I wanted to, I don't have a prepared statement, I'm sorry, but I wanted to ask, I suppose, I know that there are a lot of neighborhoods in Ridgewood that have had a lot more flooding and drainage issues and that the city is working hard on fixing what it can. Um, my street particularly is very flat and some residents of the street have regraded their property. Some residents have filled in and, and worked on trying to fix their individual drainage issues to varying levels of success. We're working on our own projects. Um, and I would love to ask, since I've never lived in a village before with any kind of water service at all, um, who I would talk to about a holding pond that is a little bit uphill that has started to back flow onto our street and has killed, I don't know how many trees, just sort of in, in progress. Um, so I wanted to just level that that is happening. It's something I see every day because it's right outside my house, but probably not something many people in the village see, but I believe that it's affecting the whole neighborhood adversely. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Anyone else from the audience? Rohan De Silva, 521 West South River Road. I'm not sure. Uh, where's the tech person? Do I keep this on? Do I not keep this on? You can keep that on. OK. No feedback, nothing? Not so far. I'll let you know. OK. And, so, and if you could just speak into the mic, Rohan. If you could speak into the mic. Can you not hear me? Um, yeah, it's, we it's better. We can hear you better if, you, if the mic's a little closer. OK. Yeah. No, I, I, I can step forward okay. to it. Please keep that in mind when y'all are speaking too. So it's, it's important for communication. So a few months ago maybe, I think sometime in January, I spoke with the village manager and I was promised information. To this date, I haven't been provided any information. I'd like to know what the problem with the information gathering is and why it hasn't been sent out to me. So that's number one. I st we still vehemently oppose your plan for the Shedler property. It's, you're talking about flooding today. There'll be many houses that will be flooded because of your plan in the Shedler community. And, sorry? No one said anything. I heard a sound. Somebody coughed. OK. So that's, that's essentially it. I continue to oppose your plan. I think it's short-sighted. You've already put, um, I'm trying to look, search for the correct word here, but unchecked soil onto that property. And I find it incredibly callous when I hear the message from the village to be, well, we're not going to hold anybody accountable because it wasn't 
based on malice. When I speed down 25, over 25 on the road, there's no malice then either, but I'm still given a ticket if I'm caught by the police. There's accountability that has to be involved. So everybody who didn't do their job on the council, or not on the council, but in the village, and I guess also on the council, should be held to the same standard every citizen is. So if somebody allowed soil that came in there, didn't check it, didn't follow the proper procedure, they should be held accountable. And if you don't hold them accountable, you should be held accountable. Because it is your job to look after the citizens of Ridgewood. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Retra De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road, um, F-R-E-T-T-R-A-D-E-S-I-L-V-A. Thank you. Um, my comment is uh, there are a lot of pieces that continue to be added in connection with the review and implementation of um, the plans for the Shetler property, and uh, I think it would be beneficial to the entire community to have an understanding more, more comprehensively of what, what's going on maybe in one place. Uh, it may be on the website because it seems as if, you know, there's um, this test for this amount, this consultant for this, this report for that. It would be nice to see how much in total, if we have an overall budget for this, uh, if we've allocated a certain amount in total to look at these things. Um, how is it being paid for? And if it could be in one place, that would be very helpful, I think, for the community to know how much money we're spending uh, in connection with, with um, the, the, the review and, and the responses. Um, that, that's, that while I'm not in favor, as my husband has stated, with the proposed plan, um, I do think it's of interest for the entire community to understand exactly all of the pieces that seem to be kind of disjointed and the money that's associated with it. Thank you. Thank you, Vretja. Anyone else from the audience? Seeing none, we're going to go to our public access. Greg, you're up. You, oh, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Greg Lemberg, and I live in Westfield, New Jersey. I'm calling tonight to express my deep concern about the proposed artificial turf project in, on the Shedler property. Greg, if you could give us your address, please. Yeah, it's 528 Grove Street in Westfield, New Jersey. Thank you. Yep. So first, let's call it what it is. It's plastic grass. 40,000 pounds of plastic grass on a typical field. That's equivalent to millions of plastic grocery bags, the ones the state banned two years ago because of the plastic pollution crisis. These plastic bags are made from polymers derived from fossil fuels and typically contain numerous chemical additives, including ultraviolet inhibitors, flame retardants, colorants, plasticizers, and per and polyfluoral alkyl, alkyl substances, otherwise known as PFAS. These chemicals leach out of the plastic and pollute the water, soil, and air in the local community and beyond. Many of these chemicals are known to elevate the risk of negative health outcomes, especially in children whose bodies and immune systems are still developing. Plastic grass fields are a triple threat to climate change. The plastic blades off-gas carbon dioxide and methane in perpetuity, particularly when exposed to sunlight. These fields create heat islands, reaching temperatures significantly higher than surrounding natural spaces. And finally, they replace natural ecosystems, thus destroying a carbon sink. The plastic blades break apart into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually becoming microplastics. These microplastics migrate from the field and contaminate the water, soil, and air. Microplastics are everywhere, including in the food we eat and in our bodies. The hundreds of thousands of pounds of infill used on these plastic fields is another issue entirely. 
thiochrome is most commonly used and is a chemical cocktail of carcinogens, endocrine disrupting compounds, and neurotoxins. Even alternative infill materials contain additives with similar health concerns. In short, the safety of artificial turf materials has never been demonstrated, and the impact to the climate and the pollutants these fields shed into the environment is indisputable. I would encourage you to invest in renovations to and organic maintenance of your natural grass fields overseen by the sports field manager with the expertise needed to get the most playing time out of fields without the negative impact of the environment or the youth who use these fields. Protecting our natural spaces should be a priority for all of us. I hope you agree. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Greg. Saurabh, you're up. Can you hear me? We can. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you for your service and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Saurabh Dhani and I live at 390 Bedford Road. Um, I'm calling today because there was a press release and- uh, Saurabh, and if you could speak just a little more slowly, um, the connection isn't that good. And, sure. and a little louder. Okay, so uh, I'm calling because there was a press release a few weeks ago regarding a safe route to school grant and that was a federal grant and the photo op and the release was from the congressman um, and the federal grant. Uh, subsequent to that press release, I saw another press release from our assemblyman um, for our district and that was for a state grant for the similar title. And the federal grant and the congressman's press release mentioned 178,000 and the state assemblyman's um, press release mentioned $157,000. But I've not seen any mention of that in any of the Ridgewood press um, at the manager's website or village website. So I just wanted to know what these part of the same grant, are these two different grants, and uh, is that going to give you any opportunity to reduce our taxes? Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Jean, you're up next. You're on mute, Jean. There you go. My name is Jean Lemberg. I live at 528 Grove Street in Westfield, New Jersey. I am calling this evening because although you might not realize it, the land use choices that you make as Ridgewood Town Council members impact all inhabitants of planet Earth, regardless of zip code. Your plan to blanket Shedler Park with a plastic grass athletic field will not only poison Ridgewood's children, but children throughout our state, country, and world. If you find this idea shocking or offensive, then you are likely unaware of the negative impact of plastics on human and planetary health. You owe it to current and future generations to become educated about plastics by watching Plastics Impact on Human Health with Dr. Philip Landrigan. This webinar can be viewed on YouTube and the website beyondplastics.org. The health concerns raised by Dr. Landrigan apply to each of Ridgewood's existing artificial turf athletic fields, as well as the new plastic grass field planned for the Shedler property. A plastic carpet makes up the top or visible layer of all artificial turf fields. Each plastic carpet contains millions of blades of plastic grass, which break apart into microplastics, pieces of plastic less than five millimeters in length due to the wear and tear of sports activities and exposure to the elements. The microplastics and the toxic chemicals they contain, including PFAS, migrate off the field and into the air, soil, groundwater, storm drains, and eventually into the food chain and us. Communities in Massachusetts and Maryland provide a model for creating natural grass athletic fields that are rain out resistant and designed to withstand sports activities. These communities have a reverence for soil health and the determination to create natural grass athletic fields that grow stronger and more resilient over time with the use of organic and regenerative maintenance practices. Please 
bolster your knowledge about how land use choices can either exacerbate or mitigate climate change. The Soil Story, a short video produced by Kiss the Ground, illustrates why healthy soil is crucial to having a habitable planet. Another short video, Organic Management of Natural Grass, demonstrates a proven method for creating strong, healthy, natural grass athletic fields. As elected officials, your actions have a greater impact than those of individuals. Please act to stop the destruction of our planet by taking to heart this message from Dr. Seuss's environmental fable, The Lorax, quote, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot Nothing is going to get better. It is not, end quote. Later is too late to do the right thing for our environment. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jean. Susan, you're up. All right, um, Susan Ruan, um, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Um, I'm going to piggyback of, on a few topics that were discussed, and that was one from one of the statements about flooding. Um, I know that um, there has been a notice that, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers is coming in to review flooding in Ridgewood, and I was wondering when will residents be um, meeting with them to discuss, you know, like the situation the, the speaker spoke earlier of. Um, and people who are along the river, um, and what sort of up-to-date will be given for um, residents to keep informed of what's being done? Um, because I believe there are two, I, I attended the Green meeting and you know he spoke about the different ways to get funding and approval for, um, for items concerning flooding. Um, all right, the second is, um, and this is again, just about notices, um, and that's Kingsbridge, the footbridge. Um, will residents be given any notification to when the footbridge will begin? Um, just, you know, just to know and stuff, as well as for West Saddle River Road, I believe it is slated to be repaved. And I just wanna know when will residents be given notice for that just so they could take alternatives or know what's happening for the road um and that's pretty much it thank you thank you susan jane you're up you're on mute jane there you okay. go okay <laughs> um my name is jane conrad um i live at 35 roosevelt road in Maplewood in Essex County. And I'm here to comment on your situation um, regarding the artificial turf fields in your town that are flooding repeatedly. Um, it's no secret that we're all facing the same problem all over the state. Um, you know, there's this 10 week period in the fall and the spring when fields are in high demand by organized sports. But as we also know, um, you know, turf is extremely expensive, um, contains PFAS, which I know is the last thing Ridgewood needs more of. And it, you know, whereas turf seemed like it was helping in an earlier era um, when it didn't, when we didn't have quite so much rain, it really cannot handle the extreme rainfall era that we're headed into um, because it does not allow water to soak into the ground under the field. And so as a result, it's, it's still, you know, concentrating it in the drain system and sending it out into the stormwater system, which gets overwhelmed. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing in New Jersey anyway. We're supposed to be managing, you know, the idea is keep the rain where it falls, manage it right on the property where it falls so that we won't overburden our stormwater systems. So I, I just wanted to bring up, you know, and I think you've heard uh, a couple times here that there is an alternative, which Maplewood and other towns are, are starting to look into. And that is to follow the example of communities like uh, Springfield and Marblehead, Massachusetts, 
that have figured out ways to maintain high use grass fields that, you know, it's like 1,000 to 2,000 hours of play per year, you know, right up there with what turf delivers. And there are case studies available online um, that you could check out. They document, you know, these hours of usage and they also show you how it's done. And what encouraged us is um, seeing that one person can manage 70 acres of, of parks and sports fields, doing the extra operations that are needed to make them uh, work at this high level of usage. So, you know, I feel like Ridgewood could do this. I bet you could get Green Acres money to convert your turf fields next to the river back to grass, and they would probably work better than ever. You know, the, the DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers would probably really support that. You know, you could install grass on top of those stone drainage layers. And, um, you know, anyway, people forget that healthy soil is 25% air space. So there's already, like in a foot of soil, there's already three inches available that, you know, can fill with water and so on. So I just, I urge you to investigate it. If Massachusetts can do it, New Jersey can do it, you know, we are supposedly the garden state. So if we can't grow grass, then who can? Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jane. And seeing no one else, I'm gonna close public comment and we will go on with the rest of our agenda. We'll begin with our village manager's report. And oh, does anyone have any responses for anything? Keith? Um, I do, but I can hold them until the good. council's come to. I do too, but do you want to go them first before the report? Sure. Okay. Um, so very quickly to Mrs. Loving, um, we can recreate that um, informational flyer, and I think Dawn can start working on that tomorrow so that we can get out, that out there for the spring season. Um, Elizabeth, um, welcome to Ridgewood. I want to introduce you to Chris Rudishauser. He's uh, the gentleman sitting to my far right. Um, he is our village engineer. Um, and after we adopt the budget, if you'd like to connect with him in the hallway, I'm sure he can help you um, with that inquiry about the flooding. Chris, wave a little higher because she can't see you. <laughs> there you go. He's the, he's the he last is. person in the room that you'll miss. Yeah, that I'll uh, you. Elizabeth, he is a delight and welcome to Ridgewood. <laughs> uh, Mr. De Silva, we can, we can speak offline after the meeting about any information um, that may be owed to you based on our conversation earlier this year. Um, but I will tell you that with regard to the illegal soil dumping, um, I just want to confirm that Chris Rudishauser was the one that reported the illegal dumping in July of 20 to the Ridgewood Police Department. Um, the folks who were caught making that deposit of soil uh, were reported to the police. They were caught on camera. They were issued two summonses by the Ridgewood Police Department, and they appeared in municipal court where they pled guilty and took on a fine. Now, what I can say beyond that is that wherever that went with prior administration, I can't speak to. Um, whether there was an investigation into what type of soil was deposited there, what direction came um, at the time, I can't speak to that, but I can tell you that the incident was not ignored. It was actually brought to municipal court here in Ridgewood. So I want that to be clear. Um, Mrs. De Silva, uh, there are seven items that are, have been requested with regard to the Shedler Park Development application by the DEP. I think I reported on them uh, rather concisely at a previous council meeting. Um, we are in the process of responding to that letter from SHPO. Uh, we are utilizing Suburban Consulting, which is an engineering firm, uh, to help us do a fields analysis study and help prepare the formal response to SHPO. Um, as a separate work effort, uh, we've been working with Grubb, Richard Grubb Associates, who is an archaeological firm. They have provided a Phase 1B study. They are now going to be authorized tonight by a council resolution to proceed with a supplemental phase 1B because SHPO came back and requested additional information. Depending on the result of that study, uh, SHPO may decide to ask the village to pursue a phase 2 archaeological study, and at that point we would pursue that with Richard Grubb Associates as well. So I hope that clears where the, the professional service contracts are, and both of those are on 
the agenda for tonight for council consideration and potential approval. Um, moving on to um, Mr. Donnie. Um, Sarab, we did receive a $178,000 grant uh, through a federal appropriation, which was announced by Congressman Gottheimer. I reported on that at a previous council meeting. And tonight, under the manager's report, I'm going to report on a second grant that was also received to support our Safe Routes to School initiative, which was is DOT funding, and it was announced by Senator Corrado, Assemblyman DePhillips, and, Senator, and S Assemblyman Barless last week. So we have $178,000 grant coming from the federal government and $157,000 grant coming from the state. Um, on tonight's agenda, via Resolution 24-134, there is an award of contract to NV5 in the amount of $143,000 to help design that project. And those funds that are going to be received by the state and federal government will go to support that contract award that the council will consider tonight. Um, Suzanne, you spoke about the Army Corps of Engineers meeting. We are, look, we are looking to confirm a date, hopefully by our next council meeting, which is April 24th, with the Army Corps for a mid-June in-person and hybrid meeting here in the courtroom. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers will come in and make a presentation to the public. We will notify everyone who is um, affected by flooding. Uh, we have those areas pinpointed through our GIS mapping and through some records in the engineering department. Uh, we will send out notice with regard to that, and the Army Corps will come and present both their short-term programming to address flooding and their long-term opportunities uh, that the village can pursue to address flooding, um, which would that's going to take a little bit more time. And finally, with regard to the footbridge and any paving at West Saddle River Road, um, once those contracts are awarded after design, uh, the contractor is traditionally required to notify the residents in the immediate area who are affected. And I have no doubt that both for the footbridge project and for the paving of West Saddle River Road, the contractor will be required uh, working with our engineering department to notify all residents. So, Mayor, that's what I have in response to the public. I don't want to defer to uh, Councilmember Winograd. Sure. So, I wanted to say two things to the Hopper resident. I believe your first name is Elizabeth. If you'd like to write me and Deputy Mayor Perrin, there are some citizens groups who have been involved from both Hopper Ridge and from Hope Street, which is, even though they're by street further away from you, if you walked along the river, pretty close. So, if you write us, our emails are on the website, and they have a longstanding effort, and they're your neighbors, but just not by street through the woods, up the river, and that way. Um, that's one. Two, um, with respect to safe routes, I feel, I want to say this, we are extremely fortunate to get this, and because there are parents here and people, this is a great time to start talking about walking. I'm an ex-orchard chair. We're going to receive a lot of funding, both federal and state, and that's exciting, and that's making our community more walkable to school. So I hope this is the next step, is that we all think about that and start walking to school a little bit more and reducing congestion. And I'm really grateful to both of the state and the federal agencies that are giving us that money. It's exciting for Ridgewood. Um, Thetra, I, we are putting as much that we can on the website. As Keith said, some of these letters are dense. But I, too, share your concerns because I wanted to take a moment with everybody understanding that the historic declaration for the House is a good thing, but the minute that occurs, the price of the project goes up. Because in order for people to touch that land, that house now, you have to have premium, more highly specialized people. So the initial cost of the house was around $800,000-ish. Once it was declared historic, and for other reasons, it went to $2.6 million. So there is an over, um, there's a budget, there's a longstanding budget. It's been contributed over the years by many councils. But that historic declaration makes decision makers <coughs> like us reliant on highly technical, specialized people. In addition to that, we have scenarios that we're just going to pay the best people to do. And the soil contamination is a serious thing, and we want to hire the best possible people to make sure it's addressed. So um, these fees are expensive. When the house was declared historic, it instantly goes up. Anything historic makes it more expensive. So I just wanted to say that if you want any of the detail, it is on the website. Um, it's listed. We're identifying it. Each week we disclose this. We're listing the numbers tonight. Even in uh, the sunshine binders, you'll see how many 
how much money we're spending for grub and for the services to comply with SHPO. So I just want to make sure everyone knows it is expensive and it is adding up. Archaeological studies are not cheap and the historic declaration of the house, that the minute that was done, rightfully, it increased the cost significantly for the overall project. Um, and I think that's it. That's it. Everybody good? Good. Let's move on. Keith? Mayor, under the manager's report, uh, first I want to uh, say Eid Mubarak to all those who are out there celebrating the end of Ramadan. Um, and in sad news, it's, um, it's been a sad week here in the village. Um, on Friday, we learned that we lost our court administrator, Kim McWilliams. Um, I want to express on behalf of the entire village staff our condolences to Kim's family. Um, she not only served us here in the village, but she served the um, folks in Glen Rock and in Wyckoff through a shared services agreement. Um, when I think of Kim McWilliams, who I have only had the pleasure of knowing for a short time, uh, the first word that comes to my mind is that she was a warrior. Uh, when I first met her, she shared with me that she was battling cancer. But if you ever encountered Kim in the office or in the hallway, you would never know that she was. She was always smiling. She was always professional. She always had a plan for the future of improving the municipal court operations here in Ridgewood. Um, and I know that she is going to be missed by our entire staff. Um, under the manager's report tonight, um, Commissioner Donnie stole my uh, thunder on the $157,000 grant award, but I do again want to thank Senator Corrado, Assemblyman DePhillips, and Assemblyman Barless for their efforts in delivering those funds through the Department of Transportation uh, to enhance our safe routes to school program. Last evening, uh, Recreation and Parks Director Nancy Bigos and I had the opportunity to meet with the residents who live in and around Veterans Field to talk about the lighting project. Um, we circulated uh, this informative packet that Nan put together. Um, I ha I'm pleased to say uh, that the main concern amongst the residents was that there would be an extension of time that the lights would be on beyond the 9 or 9.30 curfew. Uh, we assured them that we did not feel that there was an interest or desire on behalf of the, the council or even on behalf of the Board of Education through what we've learned at the Fields Committee, uh, that there is any interest in extending the time of play on Veterans Field. So I think the residents understood that this project has the ability to improve their quality of life. Uh, directional lighting technology has improved tremendously since these lights were installed in the late 1980s. Um, and I think everyone walked out of the meeting confident that this would be an improvement at Vets Field. Uh, we also extended the opportunity for the residents to visit Maple Field while the lights are on so that they can see comparable technology that already exists here in the village. I also attended last night the Shade Tree Commission meeting. I want to thank Neil Galone from our MIS division at Ridgewood Water uh, for working with Shade Tree and Director Bigos on establishing a tree inventory that I have to say is second to none. Um, the mapping actually depicts all of the trees that are currently in the municipal and county right-of-ways throughout the village. It also identifies any stumps that are in need of being removed, and it also uh, shows future planting locations and what the spef specifications are around those locations so that our Parks and Recreation Department can plan out with the contractor where the best places to plant trees are and where the largest need is within the village. So I'm going to thank Neil and the Shade Tree Commission for their efforts in that space. Um, this Sunday, Valley Hospital will officially close its doors uh, for traditional hospital services. The emergency room will close at 6 a.m. and all patients will be diverted to the new campus at Valley Hospital in Paramus. Uh, yesterday, myself, Chief Lyons, Chief Judge, and Director Kleiman had the opportunity uh, to visit the new hospital. Uh, we met with the leadership team there who is in charge of transition, along with many representatives from County OEM and the Paramus Police Department. Um, I can tell you that I am very confident uh, that this transition that's set on Sunday 
where we will have up to 75 ambulances which will stage at Graydon North and South uh, to transport at this point somewhere around 350 patients uh, from the Ridgewood campus to the Paramus campus. Um, it's a well-organized operation and the best thing that we can do as residents and visitors to the village is avoid Linwood Avenue on Friday until about three or four o'clock, um, on Sunday, until about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, their transition process begins Friday evening, um, but the actual shutting down of the emergency room and traditional hospital operations and the beginning of the transportation of the patients from Ridgewood to Valley will commence at 6 a.m. Um, I also want to announce on the recreation front that Maple Field will be closed uh, for the morning and into early afternoon. Um, anyone who is participating in any type of sporting or athletic events um, back here on Fetz Field, we're asking you to please park in Village Hall parking lot um, and not disturb the ambulance operation over in the Graydon area. Um, we have had two meetings this week um, regarding our capital budget for 2025. And I want to thank uh, Chris Rudershauser and Jim Fells from the Water Pollution Control Facility um, for their foresight in thinking about what type of capital improvements we will need for our sewer system heading into 2025. And yesterday I met with the um, emergency personnel folks, Chief Lyons, Chief Judge, Director Kleiman, Bob Rooney, our CFO, to talk about our communications needs moving into next year. Um, I report that out because while we're adopting the capital budget for 2024 tonight, we're already working on what our capital budget is going to look like in 2025. Um, I want to thank uh, Rich Calby and Sean Hamlin from our Sanitation and Recycling Division. Um, this past Saturday, we had a shred day over at Graydon. Unfortunately, we filled up the truck very quickly and they fill it up once and then the service ends. Um, they were able to add an additional shred, shred day for this spring, which will be May 12th. I understand it's Mother's Day, but come in the morning, <laughs> we'll probably fill up another truck, um, but get there early because uh, the, uh, the shred day is a popular event and I wanna thank Recycling for putting that together. A few announcements, online registration for grade and pool and the tennis pickleball badges began on April 1st. You can still register through Community Pass. Preseason badge distribution or in-person assistance will be available Monday through Friday at the stable from 8.30 to 4.30, and in person at the Graydon Badge Office on Saturday, May 11th, and May 18th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Yard waste pickup began on Monday, April 8th. Please check the village calendar for your collection area. And also, please remember that the address lookup feature is now live again on the village website. You can just type your address in and your collection dates will populate. The RBSA opening day parade will take place on Saturday, April 20th. Parade will begin at 9 a.m. at the Ridgewood train station and continue down Ridgewood Avenue to Maple Field and end behind us on Vets Field. The 2024 Daffodil Festival and Earth Day Fair will take place on Sunday, April 21st in Memorial Park at Van Ness Square from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Uh, Ridgewood Health Department uh, will be hosting a discussion on Lyme disease and ways you can protect yourself on Thursday, April 25th from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. in the Youth Lounge on the first level of Village Hall. To register, please call 201. 670-5500 extension 2312 or register on community pass. The health department will also be hosting its annual dog rabies clinic at Graydon Pool on Wednesday, May 8th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. You can contact the health department for more information. Upcoming village council meetings, April 24th is our next work session, May 1st work session, May 8th will be our next public meeting, May 22nd is a work session, all start at 7.30 p.m. And that concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you, Keith. And we will now go to our council reports. Siobhan? Sure. So um, yesterday we met with the Fields Committee. I want to say thank you to Cynthia O'Keefe for making some recommendations. I know some people had trouble getting online. Um, we're working with the Board of Ed. The Board of Ed issues the agenda, and we're having um, an opportunity to enhance our compatibility. So thank you for letting us know. We very much appreciate feedback like 
like that so the public can attend. Um, it was a, a lively discussion. Uh, the Fields Committee is a joint board between Board of Ed and the Village, and we had a celebrity guest, Ross, from Suburban, who is the consultant that we hired to assess the demand, the true demand on our fields for the Shedler application. And this is a unique opportunity because in, the last time we really looked at our fields holistically was in 2006. And in 2006, um, we didn't own Shedler, and Habernickel had yet to be developed. So things have changed a lot, and we were the Board of Ed was incredibly welcoming and inclusive with Ross, and I think the sports community was grateful for him to be there. Some interesting facts were noted that um, all of the sports groups have paid for fields significantly outside of our district during this time of flooding, and Ridgewood Lacrosse said that last season their boosters organization spent upwards of $35,000. Um, so I want to thank our groups. I want to thank Nancy Bigos. It was a long, these meetings start at 7 a.m. And uh, they sometimes end, if we're lucky, by 9, and sometimes they go all the way to like 1 o'clock. But uh, thank you to everybody there, and thank you for being so welcoming to Ross and the concept. Um, last night, I had the pleasure, I'm the Shea Tree Liaison, and as Keith mentioned, we had Neil Galone, who came and uh, presented the GIS survey. So this is a really interactive, almost like a video game, of how people who are in decision-making spots like the council can look at what's missing. What is the tree inventory for street trees? Uh, it's very cool. You can look by block. You can look by species. You can look by size of tree. It'll be a massive help in determining a big tree status, how many we have. Of the trees we have missing, how many are big, medium, or small. And I, I know I'm going to go down the tree rabbit hole a little bit here, but um, it was interesting to note that there's 3,900-ish, 30, sorry, 3,900-ish trees that are missing as potential gaps on our street. However, only 440 are in the category of medium and large, which is interesting because we know those spots are achievable and we can move quickly on that so when we are now going into our planting for this year we're going to try to put the medium and large in the ground because we know the spaces will accommodate them and now the entire shade tree commission has a log on where we can use real live data to make a better decision i also want to let everybody know on the council that we reviewed a very lovely uh, draft revision to the ordinance. And I want to take the time to thank um, <coughs> Paul and Pam sit on the ordinance meeting, which I can't go to. But my committee made recommendations, and then Pam picked up my committee and dealt with them very nicely. She stayed for the whole entire three-hour shade tree meeting last night and had a great discussion. And Matt has worked very well with them as well, drafting some enhancements to make this ordinance have a little bit more teeth. Um, I also want to thank the engineering department because they've worked very closely with the Shade Tree Commission to find out how we can make this work a little bit better um, for private landowners. So get ready because that's going to come back to Shade Tree in May and it will you know, have some edits and then it'll probably come to us in June. And um, no spoiler alert, but Lorraine, you're going to be pretty happy too. And, uh, and then lastly, um, Shade Tree and our newly adopted Girl Scout troop will be in Van Ness with um, hopefully everybody on the council to celebrate Earth Day and Daffodil Fest for the Hallabies especially, because I, I got it right, Rorick. Um, in addition to that, I just wanted to mention that the community center is fundraising. This is pretty awesome because all of our committees always talk about fundraising, and they are offering a myriad of um, beach towels, which is great for Graydon or for your travels. They come in multiple colors and water bottles. So that is online. It's a great way for you guys to have a Ridgewood memorabilia and support something that's very, very important to the town. Um, they're great for graduation gifts, and I promised Liz Cloak, who's done a lot of the heavy lifting here, and Deanna Anna Shablik that I would mention it. And lastly, um, I just wanted to take a minute and say um, thank you to Valley Hospital. Um, I know several of us up here were born at Valley. Um, my grandparents lived on Meadowbrook and my mother watched it be built, probably was one of the first patients with a broken arm. Um, and it's, it's going to be a little bit bittersweet. There'll be no more Ridgewood babies unless somebody has a home birth. And I want to Wish them the best of luck on Sunday to them, their staff, and their patients, and just say thank you for everything. And um, I really wish them well in Paramus, and I hope that their campus here stays open, thriving, and providing health care like they have been for the past several decades. Thanks, Siobhan. Evan? 
Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, so I do also want to wish all our Muslim friends and neighbors Eid Mubarak. Um, this past Sunday, I had the real pleasure of attending. It was a gathering of uh, families with young children with Down syndrome. I um, was really pleased that the village was able to provide space for um, these really wonderful group of folks to get together and meet, um, have like a really large play date. It was just really, really fantastic. Um, but one of the things that was particularly um, noteworthy that I want to call out, um, one of our village employees volunteered their time to set up the room, uh, break down the room at the end, and make sure that everyone there had um, everything they needed. Um, Deanna, and I'm going to absolutely butcher her last name, Schleben, um, Schleben. <laughs> Deanna, <laughs> so I just know where Anyway, she's just wonderful, um, caring, nurturing, took care of those folks. Um, you know, I, I was going to say it's exceptional, but it's not. It's not exceptional because all of the village um, employees go to, um, you know, just go to the utmost degree to take care of our residents. Um, but it's still, when you see it, you should call it out. And I just want to thank uh, Keith. I want to thank her, and I want to thank your entire staff for that, that sort of thing. Um, Friday night, I got to attend the Richard Art Foundation fundraiser. Really wonderful event featuring a ton of Ridgewood artists uh, that were performing um, and they were fundraising for um, to give out even more grant money to a lot of those Ridgewood artists, so great organization and I was really proud to attend. And then finally, um, I'm beyond super excited. So Ridgewood Arts Council, which I'm the liaison, um, this past week sponsored an event uh, that featured um, presentations from the Montclair Museum. Uh, it was in the library. But coming tomorrow night, so excited for this, um, we have a wonderful author here in Ridgewood named Elena Korakova. She's written three books. She's gotten acclaim from um, almost every major newspaper, you know, large uh, literary critics as well. Um, she's been a resident of Ridgewood for the last 20 or 30 years. If you read her second book, Ridgewood gets a shout out. Um, it's really, and, and it's just, I've read two out of the three. They're just wonderful. Um, I'm going to, on behalf of the Ridgewood Art Council, get to lead a conversation with Elena um, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at the library. Would really invite and hope anybody who can attend to please do be talking about you know how she became a writer later in life, um, her journey from uh, Russia to Ridgewood, um, you know just her writing style. It's just I, I sat down with her and spent about an hour with her last week prepping for it, and I'm convinced I'll probably have more fun than anyone else there will. Um, but um, really really exciting event. I'm sure my fellow council members will all do their best to attend, but I obviously would ask uh, all of you who can make it tomorrow night seven o'clock at the library. Thanks, Evan. Lorraine? Thank you. Um, so before tonight's meeting, there was a cash or shell meeting. And I just wanted to announce that a week from tonight, so next Wednesday, all day, lunch and dinner, food and drinks, the Steel Wheel is going to donate 20% of their sales to cash or shell. So go to Steel Wheel next Wednesday. Have lunch, have dinner, have a couple cocktails, whatever, and you know 20% of your bill is going to the cash or shell. So shout out to them and thank you. Um, I just wanted to repeat that this year on Thursdays, cash or shell will have somebody June through September 5th on Thursday nights from 8 to 10. They will be invited bands or, um, you know, bands that we're going to pay, pay. September 5th, the last one will be the Nerds. On, Thursday, on Tuesdays in July and August, one of our local musicians, Joe Oriente, is coordinating bands for every Tuesday for those two months, July and August. And they will be from 8.30 to 10 every Tuesday night. Um, the schedule will be announced this weekend about what bands will be here on Thursdays. Next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, CSAC will meet April 18th, 7.30 in the Garden Room. Everyone is welcome to attend. And just another shout out, Project Pride, our planting day is Sunday, May 19th. Anyone that likes to get their hands dirty or doesn't like to get their hands dirty, we can use all the volunteers we can get. You can email me at lreynolds at ridgewoodnj.net um, or my email address is on the website. And I hope to get a lot of people volunteering. As we all say, many hands make light work. So hopefully we will have many hands. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. Pam. Thank you. 
Uh, Green Ridgewood met last week. We spent a lot of time uh, planning for the Daffodil Fest and Earth Day Fair. We hope all of you will come and your dogs too. Uh, because we do have the Daffy Dog Parade that day, and uh, the band will be Blue Plate Special. We also are planning for the Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs to make a presentation to council here on May 1st regarding their research on flooding and decarbonization in Ridgewood. Um, I too attended the Ridgewood Arts Foundation event at the Unitarian Society and it really is amazing how much talent we have in Ridgewood. It was just a great night and I felt privileged to be there. Um, Chamber of Commerce had a grand opening on Franklin Avenue of the Golden Hour Salon. It is a full service salon and I got to cut the ribbon. So that was nice. The Central Business District Advisory Committee meets tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. via Zoom. The agenda is on the Village website along with the link if you would like to join us. We will be discussing, among other things, blade signs, um, which we're voting on tonight, uh, introducing that ordinance, and also amendments to the zoning um, ordinance and as well as looking again at a prospectus that one of our members has drawn up for the Central Business District. The Open Space Committee will be meeting on April 18th at the Stable. Um, anyone is welcome to join us, and that's all I have. Thanks, Pam. And I just want to take a moment. Obviously, tonight was a, a lovely night, but the day started out just as lovely. Um, uh, Keith and Evan mentioned um, Eid, as a uh, as today is a day of that the, the Muslim community celebrates Eid, it's spelled E I D, and Eid Mubarak means blessed Eid. It's like when we say Merry Christmas. It's it's what you say, and Eid. Just for those of you who aren't aware, because ten years ago I was completely unaware, and this morning I was invited to attend um, an Eid celebration at the Muslim at the uh, Muslim Mosque in Midland Park known as El Zara. I've been there many times. Um, it is such a lovely day. Um, uh, much of our growing and large uh, Ridgewood Muslim community were there. They invited me to attend. Um, it is a truly a lovely celebration. It marks the end of Ramadan. And again, for those of you unaware, Ramadan is a, about a 30-day uh, period when Muslims fast to uh, uh, realize how fortunate they are um, and, for, and to realize that there are those who are far less fortunate. And today is a day of celebration and feast. And let me tell you, when they feast, these people feast. Um, but it is a lovely day and I urge you all to learn more and to find out more about our Muslim community, about their customs and traditions. You know, we know about you know, Christian traditions, we know about Jewish traditions, um, and, and it, this is truly a a lovely, lovely, wonderful community. And by the way, their food is really good. <laughs> so um, uh, you will enjoy that. And that's all I have for today. And so we can continue with our regular agenda. And so we're going to go to our public hearings. And the first is an ordinance that I move the clerk read ordinance 3993 by title on second reading, and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Perrin. Well, Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Badgianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3993? Calendar Year 2024 Ordinance to Exceed the Municipal Budget Appropriation Limits and to Establish a Cap Bank. The public hearing is now open. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Board, A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. No comment on this public hearing, but I do want to ensure that there are numerous public hearings tonight, and will people who are online also be able to participate? I believe the clerk has advertised it as such, so I would ask the mayor to ensure that if there's anybody waiting, that they are also able to comment on the public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you for pointing that out, Boyd. Um, I have the, the hybrid access. Uh, right in front of me, so if I see anyone, 
I will call on them. And just so you know, Deputy Mayor Perrin is always making sure I pay attention and elbows me kind of hard sometimes if I'm not paying attention. Seeing no other public comments, I move the public <coughs> hearing be closed. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. I move that Ordinance 3993 be adopted on second reading and final publication as required by law. I second the motion. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of the 2024 budget? 2024 budget for the Village of Ridgewood, New Jersey. The public hearing on the 2024 budget is now open. Mayor, can I just stop you there? We're going to do the presentation before you open to yeah. the public. I, I just got ahead of myself. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, um, Keith. May I? By all means, and okay. uh, we will not open the public hearing just yet. Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, call up, and he's already on his way, our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Bob Rooney. Um, tonight, we are going to give an abbreviated um, synopsis of the budget amendments. Uh, these are some slight modifications to the budget from the time we introduced just over a month ago. Um, as Bob takes his seat, I do just want to take a moment uh, to thank all of our department directors and our supervisors uh, for their support in this process, which, as I mentioned at the last budget meeting began last September. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, those who are here tonight. We have Chris Rudishauser, our municipal engineer and department director for Public Works, Jeremy Kleiman, our Office of Emergency Management Director, Chief Lyons from the Ridgewood Police Department, Chief Judge from the Ridgewood Fire Department, Nancy Bigos, our Director of Parks and Recreation, uh, William Palumbo, our Tax Assessor, Dawn Centrula, our Director of Health, Heather Maylander, who's not here, but capably sitting in, Eileen Young, our Deputy Municipal Clerk, uh, Lori Steinbacher, our Director of the Public Library, Dylan Hansen, our IT Director, uh, Rich Calby is not with us tonight. He is actually commuting back from Washington, D.C., uh, where he met with just about a dozen members of Congress with regard to water-related issues. Um, and also was advocating for additional funding for, Rich, for Ridgewood Water. So I want to thank uh, Director Calby for, for making that trip. Anthony Merlino, our Director of the Building Department. Um, Bob Rooney, our Chief Financial Officer. And I also want to thank from Bob's office, Steve Sanzari um, and Olivia, who both worked very diligently on helping to prepare this budget. I also want to extend thanks to uh, Carol Bukowski, our new communications director who was not necessarily part of putting the budget together but she has certainly done a yeoman's job in educating the public over the last month about what it contains and Beth Spinato who is uh, my right hand in my office uh, who has helped us along this process so with that um, and there are PowerPoint copies of the PowerPoint presentation um, over near the transparency binders um, but we're going to move forward with the 2024 budget amendments and to discuss the changes um, that the state made with regard to our general revenues. I'll turn it over to Bob. Good evening, and thank you very much for um, addressing the amendment to the budget tonight, as well as the final adoption. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. It's been a long journey, and hopefully we will finish it tonight. So we have amendments that were required by the state because of some revenue adjustments that were made after we introduced the budget. The result is a $9,359 increase in energy receipt tax, municipal re relief funds of $165,999, an adjustment for receipts from delinquent taxes, which is available through the state regulations for outstanding taxes. This is offset by reduction um, in our amount to be raised by taxation of almost $54,000 for a total revenue adjustment increase of $188,415. We are proposing to use these funds to increase the amount for other insurance for employees to offset any increases that we are picking up this year in the amount of 54407 We are using 3558 to support the supervision of our Class three officers at the Board of Education, $62,450 for equipment for our Class three officers, $25,000 restored for uh, funding for our volunteers for EMS, 
40,000 vehicle maintenance restoration for cuts that we made previously for vehicle maintenance, and 3,000 for summer concerts for cleaning costs, resulting in the total of 188,415. So Bob, if I may, just on a couple of these issues, um, you'll notice that the, the offset with the revenue, the increase in revenue and the appropriations is an equal amount, 188,415. Um, with regard to insurances, um, we went through a process earlier this year um, where we revised all of our um, assets and our infrastructure report um, and our vehicle reports um, that we submitted to the Joint Insurance Fund. Um, there were some significant updates to those documents, uh, especially in light of the water infrastructure that's being built out by Ridgewood Water. Uh, so we do have, uh, we, do, we, will, we will absorb a slight change to our assessment in both 24 and 25 in light of those additional assets. Um, so that was the reason that Bob and I um, wanted to um, add some support uh, to, the, um, to the other insurances line. Uh, with regard to police operating expenses, the 62450 will be for startup equipment uh, to launch the Class 3 police officer program in conjunction with the Ridgewood School District in September of 2024. Uh, we have confirmed with uh, Superintendent Schwartz, and I know Chief Lyons has, has met with Mark a number of times on the uh, launch of this program, uh, that the Board of Education has included funding in their budget uh, to create these special three officers uh, moving into the new school year beginning in September. Uh, fire operating expenses, uh, we added back in $25,000 to support EMS volunteer training at the request of Chief Judge. Um, Central Garage, one of the cuts that we made um, when we were preparing the budget prior to introduction uh, was some money that was set aside for vehicle maintenance, uh, specifically for the police department. Um, in talking with Chris Rudishauser, um, our Director of Public Works, um, and Mike Junta from Fleet, uh, we made the decision to restore $40,000 uh, to make sure that we have adequate funding to be able to maintain our police fleet, fleet in 2024. And lastly, uh, recreation operating expenses. There was some question at the time of introduction of the budget as to whether or not the summer concerts on Saturday nights at Van Ness Square were going to continue this year. We've subsequently met with the, uh, the committee who is going to organize that. It's been confirmed that they do plan to have concerts um, in June, July, and August. And we have added some overtime costs so that our parks division can support those summer concerts on Saturday evenings throughout the summer. So those are the, that's the uh, synopsis of the adjustments on the appropriation side. Any questions on that, Mayor? Okay. All good. All right, we'll move to the adjustments um, in water, and these uh, were made primarily by the state. So, Bob, you want to take it from there? Sure. The adjustments were the result of reclassifications that the state required to conform to the revenue streams that were realized during the year. So there's no change in the total budget, um, and the allocations are, or the uh, revisions are as shown on this slide. So the next is your adopted budget summary. Uh, I will be asking council to pass a resolution tonight to adopt the budget with the following items to be considered. In general revenue surplus anticipated of five and a half million dollars. Overall miscellaneous revenue anticipated of 12,959,064.98. Receipts from delinquent taxes, $567,056. Minimum library tax, 2,789,460. An amount to be raised by taxation for municipal purposes of 39,658,266.68. For total revenue stream of 61,473,847.66. Budget summaries to offset. Operations within the, within the caps, which includes contingent, 48,095,139.78. Operations excluded from the cap, 3,799,874.08. Down payments for improvements, 425,000. Municipal debt service, 7,651,719. Municipal deferred charges, 272,114.80. Reserve for uncollected taxes, $1,230,000 for total operating budget in the general fund of $61,473,847.66. Under the local municipal tax rate, our budget is $1.2 million under the tax levy cap and under the appropriation cap by approximately $798,000. 
Our assessed value in 2024 increased approximately 17 million over the prior year. Municipal taxes are projected at, for 2024 at a rate of 0.6687. Our 2023 actual tax rate was 0 0.6509. So Bob, if, if I may, as we transition slides here, this next slide is going to articulate exactly what was presented to council at introduction. Um, there is no change based on the amendment that's before you tonight uh, that changes any tax impact uh, to the taxpayers here in Ridgewood. Bob? Yep. So there are no cuts in service to the residents of Ridgewood. The adjustment to tax is a .0169 increase per $100, $100 of assessed value over the 2023 rate. 2024 average home in the village is valued at $710,168. In 2023, 707,500. That results in municipal taxes for 2023 of $4,605 on the average assessed home, and for 2024, $4,749, for an overall increase in the municipal rate of $144 on the average home, which is approximately $12 per month. The municipal tax increase, as introduced and also as adopted for this evening, is 2.74% which is less than the rate of inflation today. So with that, Mayor, we'll open it up to questions from the Village Council. We also have all the department directors here that if there's anything too granular or too specific, uh, they can come forward and respond. Questions? I don't, but I, I would just like to make um, the public aware and for those tuning in, um, I know the budget hearings were not well attended. Um, I think we spent upwards of 20 or 30 hours in just budget hearings, numerous emails. Uh, I think we've had at least four or five separate presentations during these meetings. So um, I'm interested to hear what the public has to say, but I certainly feel that I've been given all the information I need um, and want to thank uh, Keith and the entire staff for the immense amount of uh, information that we've been given over these last couple of months on this budget. Anyone else? Yes. I'm very pleased to see this amendment of $25,000 for EMS training. And um, Chief Judge, I was just wondering what your thinking is. Why did you decide to do this and, and uh, how it will be used? Chief, can you come forward? This gets us about, I'd say, ballpark a reasonably starting with about eight people, eight or nine people. Unfortunately, EMT school is almost $2,000 now a person to go to, plus then um, clothing them as well. So you're looking at almost $2,500 per person just to start. So possibly upwards a little bit more. So that's kind of where we're looking at to start with and grow mm -hmm. from there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I want to say a couple things so first of all thank you Bob um, thank you to the entire staff it's like uh, thank you just doesn't seem big enough but John I want to tell you this before you leave last year when I, I, I took my seat because the, I told Paul this too um, at the beginning of the night we had this lovely lovely event and um, last year when I took my seat in January one of the first capital recommendations which was sixty thousand dollars was for a Lucas machine and I got this paper you know I was new here and I read it and I said what the heck is this and I called, and at that point they said, call fire. And I spoke with the fireman, and then I spoke with Will Kevitt from EMS, and everyone said, this is a good thing because sometimes, you know, it's a compression machine that'll keep somebody alive if they are down and out for a long period of time. And I asked questions, and Pam and I were asking questions, and we were talking about this because we live so close to the hospital. How, how often would it be used, and how, how likely was it? And because of all that input from our staff, this whole council voted yes to that machine. And when I heard that that was the machine that saved Rich's life, I felt like, thank, one, thank God we voted yes. And then two, I, I really think when you see budgets like this and even the amendments, for those, if you went back to the slide, all of the last minute amendments regard public safety, public welfare, and then the last little line is community gathering and a party in our park. And I think that says a lot to the delicate touch of what we do here. We're so lucky to have police and fire. And these are things that get criticized during our budget. All departments get criticized. Um, so I'm very grateful. 
um, to the access that I have to staff. I'm very grateful that sometimes when I'm unsure, and we all leave here with should we, should we not, that our staff really advocates for what they know to be true. And most of the time, if not all of the time, the staff is 100% right. So I want to say thank you for that. And I want to say, again, thank you to Bob and his staff and your new edition of the baby whose first budget looks so good. <laughs> and um, I just feel very grateful that I live in a town that values these things and took the time to make sure that this summer, at the, on top of being safe, you're gonna have fun in our downtown. So thank you to everybody. You know, I forgot to say that this budget really reflects the priorities of our residents. There are safety measures, um, there's, there's more lights so that the sports community can, can play more on the fields. Um, it's, it, I can't wait to see this executed. I hope you feel the same way, Bob. <laughs> and I, I just wanna thank everybody as well, all the department heads, really. I mean, the budget is honestly almost a year in the making, you know, starting on next year's budget already. And, cuts are made and then more cuts are made and then more cuts are made so i really appreciate everybody willing to you know just ask for what they really really need to have um and as pam said and siobhan so many of the budget items this year went to safety i'm thrilled about west glen sidewalks about kingsbridge footbridge Clinton Avenue sidewalks, East, East Glen sidewalks. I mean, it's, it's gonna be a lot of big changes. It'll be, it'll be great, and thank you very much. And you know, I was gonna bring this up at the end, but I, I think because we're now commenting on it. Um, I, I went back over this. First of all, I wanna thank the, my fellow council members. Um, again, tremendous amount of work. We've all agreed to this budget. We've all spent more time together than, than, um, than you probably could imagine with your coworkers. We've all gotten along really well. We've all had our, answer, our questions answered. Um, but just a couple of quick highlights. First of all, no cuts in services. Glen sidewalks all the way from Monroe to Maple. Kings Bridge is finally getting repaired probably three or four years after it should have been done. Clinton sidewalks are getting done. Two million dollars for paving is getting done. Four new cops, two new firefighters. We're putting state-of-the-art lights on vets. We're doing Habernacle uh, Pavilion. But we're not just spending money, we're also being a lot smarter with our money. Uh, first time ever we're getting a sinking fund, that way we're prepaying for things so that another council isn't stuck with a huge bill. We're starting to put a sinking fund together for uh, Maple as well as for a new fire truck. That's what responsibility looks like. Um, long term planning for next several years purchases. If you looked at our budget you could see projected expenses we were going to have over the next several years. That's the way businesses are run, that's the way real budgets are run and we had that this year. Um, we're running a larger surplus this year than we have in the past to make sure that we have enough money to meet our obligations. We've kept our headcount flat. Um, I love our village employees, but they're expensive. And um, we gotta make sure that we're, we're judicious with our dollars and we don't bring on more people than we can afford. We kept our headcount largely flat. We did all this without any of the COVID money that we've had to boost up our budget in the last couple of years. And despite adding all the things that we've added without ha and while being financially responsible, we came in at a tax increase that is substantially below the rate of inflation. We're at 2.74%. Um, Keith, Bob, outstanding job. Lorraine, Paul, Pam, Siobhan, thank you guys um, for the partnership we had up here. I'm looking forward. I never thought I'd look forward to actually like spending money, um, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to all of us voting on this tonight after we've all had so much time together to talk about this. And um, Bob has answered all of our silly questions. I do want to hear from the public, but I would have been remiss if I didn't go through that list of just wonderful things we've been able to get done by this council this year. Thanks, Ev. Um, and I have similar comments, but before I do, I, I want to share with you um, something that Siobhan mentioned about the Lucas machine. Um, I think John knows this story. When, um, when Rich had his heart, heart attack, uh, shortly after that, I was talking to Siobhan about it, and she said, you know, last year they came to us in that very tight budget year looking for a Lucas machine, which, I don't know, was it $65,000? It was, it was pretty expensive. And I remember how we were trying to save money everywhere because we had just run out of COVID money and we had not yet adjusted. And my first thought, because I didn't remember what we did, and I said to her, 
please tell me we bought it. <laughs> and she said, we did. And I thought, thank God, because you know, that's where something really hits home, that we made a decision that affected someone we know. That being said, I'm just going to echo everything that Evan said. <laughs> everything. Giant capital projects being done. Lorraine and I worked together on a bunch of them. And <laughs> it was fabulous. Um, more cops, more firefighters. Um, and again, doing this all while maintaining a 2.74% budget increase that is below the rate of inflation. I'm going to say it again, below the rate of inflation. And oh, and by the way, maintaining our AAA bond rating that every municipality in New Jersey does not have. So uh, my fellow council members, I am so proud of this budget. This is our, this is our first budget that's post-COVID that we have been able to, to work on without the constraints and of the hangover of COVID, and I am so proud. I am so proud of the work that all of our department directors did. Remember, government is about prioritizing, and that's really what it is. There's a million things you want, but they know the job. Um, Bob, Keith, um, Heather, thank you all so much, because this is a tireless effort. And as you can see, we have not yet adopted this budget, and already they've begun working on next year's. So again, let's go. Mary, you need to open it to the public now. I thought I did that. <laughs> oh, never mind. No, you tried. That. OK. <laughs> so um, the public hearing on the 2024 budget is now open. Uh, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. I did not want to disappoint Councilman Weitz, who said he wanted to hear from the public. <laughs> and it looks like I'm the only member of the public that you're going to hear from, so No, we sorry. have someone on, on hybrid access. Oh, we, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for letting me know that. Okay, just a couple of uh, questions about um, some things that appeared on uh, some of the slides here. And I also have a comment and a question about something that appeared on the slide deck that was shown during the budget introduction, but it has not been shown again tonight. Um, I was um, attended via Zoom the Board of Education meeting that took place this past Monday, and there was quite a bit of discussion uh, during the Board of Education meeting regarding the Class Three officers. So I just like to understand, in terms of what's on this sheet here. How many class three officers are you budgeting for? Come on up, Chief. And we had previously heard that the Board of Education was going to be responsible for some expenses with respect to the class three officers, and the village was going to be responsible for other expenses. So if the Chief would just kindly indicate uh, what the village's responsibility will be with respect to the officers and again how many officers are we talking about I believe I heard the number three from the manager but I don't know if he was referring to class three or the number three so that's why I want to clarify the so, so, so clarify through, through you mayor um, chief Lyons has been having these discussions with dr. Schwartz since the summer um, since he took his position as the chief of police. Mark took, assumed the responsibilities of school superintendent. And this has been a, um, almost a weekly topic between the police department and the school district. So I'll turn it over to the chief to talk about where we landed um, as both governing bodies, the Board of Education, and the Village Council uh, finalized their budgets. So a very common uh, way that this has been do being done in multiple jurisdictions is that the school board pays the salaries and the police departments pay the equipment and vehicles. So what we budgeted for is three, three class threes, but not the salaries or wages. We just budgeted for um, firearms, radios, uh, uh, uniforms, and the vehicles that they would drive so they have a, a good kind of operating base at each school. So that's all we budgeted for, and then the school would be picking up 
the actual salaries. And Chief, with, with the three officers, can you just talk about what the discussion thus far has been as far as assignment goes? So right now, the idea is to put them in uh, the high school and the two middle schools. That could change, but right now the idea is that this will provide the most coverage that we can possibly have at the, the older schools. What we'll do at, in a police department uh, realm is we'll increase our patrols of the elementary schools and not have to um, target the high school and, the, and the, um, the middle schools as much because now they will have full-time people there during all the the, the higher risk times, let's call it. And so, Chief, can you talk about potential future growth? Because I know that's been an area that you and Mark have spoken about. So, I mean, obviously, as, uh, as the police chief, uh, my primary function is to make sure everyone in the village is safe. And the most at-risk community is the children. As you can see, unfortunately, with tragic events all over the nation, schools are often targeted. My goal would be to increase this. Uh, you know, this is a good first step. My, my goal would be to have a class three officer in every school. Um, that is the model that many jurisdictions use. Uh, it is more difficult in Ridgewood, I'll be the first to say, because we have a very large school system. We have a lot of schools and a lot of campuses that would need officers, but uh, a, a lot of local jurisdictions and neighboring towns have you know, seven to eight um, class threes, which is in effect one for each school. So that would be where I'd like to grow this. At this time, I think the uh, Board of Education is doing a fantastic job just kind of beginning the process of saying, hey, let's, let's target the, uh, the, big, the big schools right now, the three biggest we have. Let's get those, see how this works. I mean, I'm very confident it's gonna work. It's worked in multiple jurisdictions. I think we can make it work very, very well here. Um, and then we can grow from there. My uh, expectation and what I plan on doing with these class threes is to have them train with us, do all the active shooter response with us, all the firearms with us, so they are as up to date as possible on all the modern techniques that you can possibly do when it comes to uh, threat mitigation, uh, de-escalation, all that. They will do all that training with us, so they will, you know, they. Even though they're retired officers, they will be at the top tier of the training that we provide right now. And Chief, just on that retired piece, could you, for the public's edification who may not know the definition of what a special three officer is, can you just define that so the public's sure. aware? So a class three officer is actually, uh, it's relatively newly created in the last you know, five or six years. It, uh, in order to be a class three officer, you have to be a retired officer who retired in good standing and basically you have to have retired within two to three years. Um, if you're outside of that for time frame, you have to go back and get uh, additional PTC, which is Police Training Commission uh, training. Um, but most of them will be have re retired within the last two to three years, and they are still, once they are back under the fold, back under the wing of the Ridgewood Police Department, they are active officers while on duty. The only difference is their off-duty powers would be different from an active officer, but for all intent and purpose, they can act as police officers. That's why we're gonna train them as such. And they will be primarily just, you know, dedicated to a school or perhaps two schools so they can float back and forth, but it will really give us that integral link. So we have a police officer already inside. So when we're responding, we already have eyes and ears that are there and they can take immediate action. So that's the main part of that program. And it's why it differenti differentiates itself from having um, a regular security guard. This officer will have a police radio and police training. So when our backup is coming, we are already fully briefed on what we have to do and what is going on in that situation. Thank you, Chief Lyons. Um, so just to clarify, you're budgeting for three if the school district decides to take less than three, that means that there will be extra money left over in this budget. Is that my understanding? Well, again, we're, we're, our, our budget calls for the essential equipment mm -hmm. um, and the startup costs, including training, for this function. So if the school district decides to go back to two, we'll, we'll have a little extra money. Um, you know, knowing the chief, um, Additional training is always something that he's talking about, so I don't think that the, the money will be ill-used. But if way. you budget for three cars and only need two, you'll have that money right. left I, over for the third car. In that $66,000, though. 66. 
there, 52. That, that doesn't include new vehicles. Let's be clear about that. Well, if we lease them, it would be hopefully included. We had put that in there. Right. So but what we would do is we would lease two instead two. of three. Thank you very much. Yeah, we would. Um, I, there's a line item there, $25,000 for EMS volunteer training. I don't understand what that is. I, I did not know that the volunteers were being used. Are the volunteers coming back, or is, is this something that I, I just don't understand what the EMS volunteer training is? Thank one, you, Chief. One Lyons. white shirt for another white shirt. <laughs> we're going to swap out chiefs right now. Sorry, uh, boy, one more time. $25,000 for uh, EMS volunteer training. I didn't know we were using the volunteers anymore. Are we going back to using the volunteers or something? So we, right now, are fully covered 24-7 by the fire department, right. as you know. Right. We are going to look into starting this up again. However, we are under the realization that the entire state, it's not just us, everywhere around you has a difficulty getting volunteers. Right? There are very few places that have. There's every day you talk to, you know, Monmouth County now has an ambulance service for the whole county as of last month. A couple towns around us, their ambulance course just closed like this week. It's just the direction, unfortunately. We're going to attempt to restart again, yes. Okay, thank you. I, I was not aware of that. So you're going to attempt to restart the program. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the last thing from the, the, the slide deck that was shown tonight is that there was an item about new cell tower. Is that a cell tower that's being constructed, or is that revenue that it's going to come onto the existing tank in Midland Park? So the cell tower is in, up and running. It was started in July, in August of 23. This additional fund, these additional funds are how I had to report it to reflect uh, 2024. So, so a tower was constructed somewhere? It's in effect, yes. I, I, I couldn't say it's a tower. It's a terminology that is used by the state. Okay. Uh, I couldn't tell you where it's located. Michael. This is Michael Kors, our business manager at Ridgewood Water. Michael, you want to talk a little bit about that revenue source? Sure. Uh, yes, the new uh, tower is not actually a cell phone tower. Excuse me, Mike, if you could speak into the mic. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the new tower, it, it is located on Glen Ave Tank. Okay. Um, so it's the existing tank just took on some more antennas. It is, yes. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, I was just curious to know if a tower had built, been built somewhere. Okay. My last comment concerns a slide that was in the slide deck, uh, again, that was shown uh, at the hearing, uh, the budget introduction on comma. Uh, I'm sorry, and uh, the slide was entitled Long-Term Structural Budget Recommendations, and there was an item on the slide that caught my attention, and it was develop a plan to enhance communication services with surrounding municipalities into a radio communication system that is currently being developed. Uh, the reason that caught my attention is because all of you know Frank Del Vecchio. Frank Del Vecchio used to be in charge of the county communication system. And um, the last time I talked to Frank, it was my understanding that there are, the county was basically building out two communication systems that could be used by any municipality in the county. One was going to be devoted specifically to public safety, and the other could be used for any municipal purpose. So my concern is, why are we developing a shared communication system and why would the Ridgewood taxpayers be interested in funding a separate shared communication system when we are already paying county taxes and the county is building out a system for the same purpose? That is, that any municipality can use. I realize that the police department has some technical uh, issues with using the county's public safety system, but in terms of a, a system that would be used for municipal government like uh, the signal department, the streets department, something like that, I just don't, I didn't understand what that meant on that slide, whether we were going to be investing money in building something that duplicates the county system or this was going to be something special. So I think the key word in that slide line is enhance. We already have an existing system with the borough of Glen Rock and with central dispatch. Um, we actually just had a meeting yesterday about this that I referenced under the manager's report. 
um, this would be upgrades to the existing system. So it's just, we it have just a, Glenmore. Yeah, we, have a dark, we have a dark fiber network uh, that is maintained by Signal um, that supports the communication system that we have in place. Um, that is due for some upgrades um, in addition to the capital budget that will be considered this evening uh, where we need some additional hardware, uh, we need software upgrades, and we need some infrastructure upgrades. So that's what that is referencing to, uh, to. I will tell you that I will not limit the possibility of expanding this out to other municipalities if the infrastructure is in place and it makes sense um, because there could be a revenue stream there. Again, that's a long-term concept that we would have to explore with Signal. Um, I know Signal does some um, maintenance um, through shared services agreements that we have with surrounding municipalities like Midland Park. Uh, that might be an area that we can grow. Um, but that'll be for future consideration. Good. Again, my concern was I was concerned about village taxpayers funding a system that was uh, a duplicate of a system that the county has when we're paying county taxes. So it's, it's, not something, it's not something new. Okay. Thank you very much. That ends my comments, and I hope that uh, I helped you out, Councilman Weitz. <laughs> Thanks, Boyd. And now we have someone on hybrid access, Susan Ruane. Susan, you're up. Um, hi, Susan Ruane, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Um, to begin with, I just want to thank you for putting the um, footbridge and repairing it this year. Um, I, I have residents all around me very happy about the news. Um, and I just have a question in regard to the grant money that we're receiving for um, safe walk to school how does that can any of the grant money be used to help um build the sidewalks on clinton and east glen that's pretty much it thank you thank you susan so through you mayor um, the safe routes to school grant uh, was initiated in the village back in 2016. Um, there are specific locations that have already been identified um, for that funding um, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe any of the proposed sidewalk projects for the 24 capital budget are included in that safe routes to school area. Is that correct? That's correct? Okay, so that money would not be able to be utilized for that, but obviously that would be able to be funded if tonight's capital budget is adopted. Seeing no one else, I'm going to close public comment. And I move the public hearing on the 2024 budget be closed. There we go. Second. Deputy Mayor Perrin? Yes. Council Member Reynolds? Yes. Council Member Weitz? Yes. Council Member Winograd? Yes. And Mayor Vagianos? Yes. And we will now vote on the amendments to the 2024 budget. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. And now, finally, the adoption <laughs> of the 2024 budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. Very anticlimactic. But <laughs> again, great work, everyone. The best I could do. And so let's move on. And so I will move the first reading of Ordinance 3998. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. Vagianos? Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 3998 by title? An ordinance to amend Chapter 269 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood Water at Section 269-8, Piping System Compliance, Right of Access. I move that Ordinance 3998 be adopted on first reading and that May 8, 2024 be fixed as the date for the hearing thereon. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Oops. Vagianos? <laughs> yes. She stepped away. We'll move on. I move the clerk read ordinance 3994 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. 
Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? No. Vagianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3994? Bond ordinance providing for distribution system repairs and replacements for the water utility in and by the village of Ridgewood in the county of Bergen, New Jersey, appropriating $4,056,000, therefore, and authorizing an issuance of $3,853,200 of bonds or notes of the village to finance part of the cost thereof. The public hearing is now open. Seeing no one, I move the public hearing be closed. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Council Member Winograd is not here. Vagianos? Yes. I move that Ordinance 3994 be adopted on second reading and final publication as required by law. I second the motion. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? We'll, we'll wait for her. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. Uh, I move the clerk read ordinance. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. No, 3995. No? Yeah. 3995. Public hearing, Mayor. Okay, I move the clerk read ordinance 3995 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3995? An ordinance to amend Chapter 145 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood Fees at Section 145-6, Enumeration of Fees Relating to Code Chapters. The public hearing is now open. Uh, good evening again, Mayor and Council Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Uh, this is the water rate increase, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Somebody say yes, please. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Um, does this increase go across all four municipalities served by Ridgewood Water, or does this ordinance affect only the residents and water subscribers who live in Ridgewood? This sets the rates for all consumers throughout the service area. So Midland Park, Glenrock, Wyckoff don't have to pass their own ordinance? No, because they're, we, we're the governing body that um, establishes the rates for Ridgewood Water. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can somebody please uh, tell me what the current PFAS surcharge is for a residential customer who has the smallest meter? I'll invite Mike back up. Actually, I'd like to know what the PFAS charges are for all the meters, if you have that data, or an average. What is the average PFAS service, char uh, service or surcharge that is now being uh, billed or, or proposed, that is now being billed, uh, the average charge? I know it's different depending upon the size of the meter, correct? Um, yes, it is set according to each meter. Uh, I do not have them by the average right now. I could do that quick calculation. But, tell, uh, tell me what the lowest and the highest is. Uh, the lowest one for our 5 eighths meter and our about 3 quarters meter is 2471. That's the proposed charge. And our highest meter at 4 inches is 617 and uh, 75 cents. Okay. Um, how much has been collected thus far in total for PFAS service, PFAS surcharges? Do you have any idea how much you've collected so far? The PFAS surcharge has been in place since when? Mike, do you have that easily accessible or is that something we can get back to Mr. Loving with tomorrow? I think that's something we could uh, more easily get back tomorrow. Okay, if you could okay. make a point to respond to Mr. Loving with that number tomorrow when you get in. I'd be happy to. Thank yeah, no, okay. Um, a number that you should have, what is the estimated total cost to remediate PFAS in the system? Uh, the estimated total cost is around uh, $140 million. $140 million. $140 million. 
and that's going to be funded by the PFAS surcharges plus it looks like on 24-119 later on you're going to be asking the federal government for 12 million and I believe there's an outstanding lawsuit is that how we intend to fund this so if, if I may um, previous administration authorized the um, author, authorized Ridgewood water to move forward with a treatment um, plan a treatment program um, that will cost up to $150 million, somewhere between 140 and $150 million. It has been said countless times um, at meetings that I've been at um, since the summer um, that the PFAS treatment um, surcharge um, is the end game for being able to fund this. In the meantime, there are, there's active litigation um, that hopefully in the next month or so we'll be able to report back on um, to the public. Um, we are looking to recoup some of the funds um, in order to offset those costs through those lawsuits. There is also an aggressive effort. Last meeting I think we, ought, we passed a resolution or the council passed a resolution that was proposed by Ridgewood Water uh, to solicit up to $12 million um, from the state government. Uh, we've already received $2 million uh, for the Goffle Road treatment facility through the federal government through the efforts of Congressman Gottheimer. Um, so there is a systematic plan uh, to try to offset what the ultimate surcharges will amount to through pursuing the litigation, state funding, and federal funding to offset those costs. I guess my final question on this is that as someone who's currently paying a surcharge and it looks like I'm going to be continuing to pay a surcharge and the bill is going to be 150 million, my concern as a ratepayer is that what if this is completely funded via a settlement and state and federal government funds. In other words, what if the 150 million is completely funded without the need for the surcharge? Is that going at, to be practical? At, at the risk of uh, the gentleman sitting to my right yelling at me, I think that's highly unlikely. Okay, I, I have no idea what this lawsuit is, what, and, how much we're seeking. And, and, and if I may, and I, I, I don't wanna go down this rabbit hole too far tonight, but the, um, the EPA announced this morning even more stringent PFAS regulations that are going to affect every municipality in the country. So when Rich gets back from Washington, um, we've already set up a series of meetings to discuss how this affects us, although I think that effect will ultimately be minimal because we're already ahead of the curve with Ridgewood Water on building treatment facilities that by the end of 2026 will pre bring PFAS to undetectable rates, which will be lower and less than the, the current state DEP regulations and which will ultimately be less than the federal regulations which were announced this morning. I see the gentleman to your right wants to say something. No, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're holding the, I, I saw you holding the mic. I thought you were going to say something. The best I can say is that I'm listening intently. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, my, my point in saying that to you, Boyd, is, you know, while this affects the ratepayers in, um, in the four towns that Ridgewood Water serves, and I'll be the first one to admit, when I, when I arrived here, I was staggered by the number. That's to a big number. I didn't know the number was that to high. To invest in this system. Yeah. But I will tell you that what was announced today is going to force every municipality, every water utility, every water service provider throughout the country to make these same hard decisions that Ridgewood Water has already made. Well, as, as the manager knows, and I don't know if you know, Michael, I had to ask for some uh, data in, uh, to compare Ridgewood Water rates with water rates for other neighbors of us in Northwest Bergen County. Uh, it was indicated to me that I would have to get that on my own, that the water department was tied up, and I did so. And what I find out is that the only water company in the area, at least by the numbers that I obtained, that is charging more than Ridgewood Water right now is Hohokus. Everybody else is, is a bit lower. So as a ratepayer, I'm somewhat concerned that 
we're up there at number two, and how much longer is this going to go on? But it looks like with a $150 million bill and possibly more coming down the road, it looks like we're going to be continuing to um, pay higher rates. And I guess the reason for that is that we're using water that can easily be contaminated uh, by the ground. And the other question is, are, the, are those other water service providers under a consent order with the DEP? Yeah. That I don't know. Yeah, that, they, and that, they, that, that's meaningful when it comes to rates. Now the gentleman does want to say something. Yeah, have they start, have those other water utilities started their treatment programs as we have? Because we've been ahead. Bridgewood Water has been at the forefront of not only asserting itself in terms of the litigation, but also in terms of treatment. So some of those are far behind us. So they may not have incurred that yet. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think, Boyd, what's going to happen, and I don't wish this upon anyone, is that um, all those other water providers, um, both in New Jersey and across the country, their rates will begin to climb. Yeah. Uh, because they have not begun treatment facilities, and we have almost completed them. And not everyone, but quite a few, will have to begin water treatment facility programs as we have. And they will all be scrambling at the same time for all the same equipment and the same expertise that by the time they get started will be done. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I'm not happy about $150 million either, but I'm far happier about safe water. The federal guidelines will have uh, bring it down by 2029. We're going to have non-detectable amounts by 2026. So listen, if we get more money than we anticipate, I have no problem giving some of it back, Boyd. I will hold you to that. I will remember that forever. Okay. <laughs> With that, I, I, I share um, Keith's pessimism. No Be date nice and time, Mrs. Loving. <laughs> um, but more importantly, because of the forward-looking view that Richard Water has taken on this issue, we are far ahead of a number of municipalities are about to go through a lot of problems to do what we've already uh, done and that will and we'll continue to do through 2026. The new EPA rule is four parts per trillion of PFAS. Imagine how small that is. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Boyd. Rohan De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. So this 24 amount, is that per what? Per month, per year, per what? It's, uh, per quarter. Per quarter. So we're charged. Thankfully, I don't look at these bills. My wife does. But it would be even more upsetting to me if I was paying for PFAS treatment and Mayor Vagianos doesn't think it's a problem to add more PFAS into the water table of Ridgewood. As he stated, it's all over the place. It's in carpets. It's in dental floss. It's everywhere. So let's add some more. If the federal government thinks this way, do you... Mayor Vagianos, do you think you should alter your position? Rohan, it's Vagianos. I'm sorry. May Vagianos. I just, rather than, I can't hear everything. So I understand. So how about if I just call you mayor? By all means. Okay. So mayor, maybe the mayor should consider altering his statement in order to, to correct this. PFAS never existed in our water system, correct? PFAS has been in our water system since, since PFAS has been made and manufactured. So it's been for years. I understand that. So four parts per trillion is four parts per trillion more than we ever had. But PFAS has been manufactured. And we didn't know that, but now we do. So let's make the correction. And, and I applaud you. I applaud Ridgewood for being ahead of the game, but you're making contradictory decisions here. I'm going to, I'm going to have to in just interject that, and I hope you can hear me, that when you have a discussion about a public hearing or on a public hearing about an ordinance, the discussion has to be about the ordinance itself. You, this is not going to be about Shedler and about that. I'm not talking issues. about Shedler. I'm well, talking about pe all the artificial turf fields in Ridgewood. You're talking about something different than, than the ordinance But, but itself. we're introducing more PFAS, and we're paying for PFAS 
remediation. Don't you think that's contradictory? I don't think it has to do with the ordinance that we're trying to put forth right now with regard to the surcharges for the PFAS treatment centers that we have to put in. Well, we, if we didn't have the issue, we wouldn't have any surcharges. And, and we're on the aquifer, we're on the, table, on the water table, right? We have, we have wells that we provide our water from, correct? If you have questions or statements about the ordinance itself, then please go ahead. This, the, while I understand your position, Matt. It's not mine, it's the way the law is. That's okay, it. while I understand the, the way the law is, this still doesn't make sense. The, the law is there, so, you know, okay, fine. Um, I'd like all the data from all the meters, not only the one, the big one, the small one. I don't know how many different meters you have. I don't know what meter I have, and I have to have that information to, to counter you or be more educated about the process in the future. So I'd appreciate that. The other thing I'd like to say to the dais is that when you say something, when, when any member of the dais says it was another administration, it's sort of deflecting responsibility from the current administration. So I think it might be better to say in 2015 or 16, or whatever the date was, that's when that happened. It's like you're not taking responsibility. And the whole point in your being up there is to take responsibility and take corrective action. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. I now move the public hearing be closed. Second. Second. Perrin. Yes. Reynolds. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. I move that Ordinance 3995 be adopted on second reading and final publication as required by law. I second the motion. Perrin. Yes. Reynolds. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. The following resolutions numbered 24-114 through 24-120 are to be adopted by a consent agenda with one vote by the Village Council. There is a brief description beside each resolution to be considered on the consent agenda. Each resolution will be read by title only. Award contract water meter test bench. Award sole source contract spare parts kits for chemical and polyphosphorate pumps. Award contract under state contract, water quality testing equipment and supplies. Award contract under state contract, server equipment for SCADA systems, rigid water and water pollution control facility. Award contract under source well cooperative purchasing program, various materials, supplies and equipment, maintenance and upkeep of rigid water facilities. Request bipartisan legislative action for $12 million in funding for PFAS treatment. Authorized Shared Services Agreement, Ridgewood Water, Lead Service Line Replacement Project, Glenrock, Midland Park, and Wyckoff. So moved. Second. Deputy Mayor Perrin? Yes. Council Member Reynolds? Yes. Council Member Weitz? Yes. Council Member Winograd? Yes. And Mayor Vagianos? Yes. I move the first reading of Ordinance 3999. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. Vagianos? Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 3999 by title? An ordinance to amend Chapter 190 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood Land Use and Development to permit freestanding signs in the P, P2, and T zones and to modify the standards associated with blade signs. I move that Ordinance 3999 be adopted on first reading and that May 8th, 2024 be fixed as the date for the hearing thereon. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. I want to just say thank you to HPC and CBDAC. This is going to make our charming downtown more charming and it's the little things, so thank you. And Vagianos. Yes, and I also want to thank um, Glenn Carlo who is the president of Chamber of Commerce, who took the initial cut at the first draft of this. 
and uh, upon which our ordinance is now based. So, yes. And now I move the first reading of Ordinance 4000. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. Bagianos? Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 4000 by title? <laughs> An ordinance to amend chapter 145 at section 145-4 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood entitled Fees as it applies to f departmental fees for chapter 67 entitled Police Services for Extra Duty. I move that ordinance 4000 be adopted on first reading and that May 8th, 2024 be fixed as a date for the hearing thereon. Second. Reynolds? I'm sorry, Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes, on number alone. <laughs> and Vagianos? Yes. Mayor, if, if I may, on this particular ordinance, I just want to publicly thank Chief Lyons and the leadership of the PBA here in Ridgewood. Um, this ordinance not only addresses the, um, the, the fees for outside duty, but it also gives us a better chance of having Ridgewood police officers staffing any of our road jobs, utility jobs, anything like that. We've had a history over the last few years of having to bring in police officers from other agencies and working with the PBA. This will give us, uh, this will put us in a much better position to have all those jobs staffed by Ridgewood Police. I move the clerk read ordinance 3996 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3996? Yes. Bond ordinance providing for various capital improvements in and by the Village of Ridgewood in the County of Bergen, New Jersey, appropriating $4,040,690, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $3,838,655 dollars bonds or notes of the village to finance part of the cost thereof the public hearing is now open seeing no one i move the public hearing be closed second mayor just to confirm there's nobody on hybrid for this right nope okay great or else um the deputy mayor would have <laughs> elbowed me just making sure yep okay Perrin. yes reynolds yes whites yes winograd yes and Vagianos. Yes. I move that Ordinance 3996 be adopted on second reading and final publication as required by law. I second the motion. Perrin? Yes, also because this is the one where we are <clears throat> allocating or, um, or appropriating $400,000 plus for tree planting. So I'm a yes. Okay. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And thank you to Shade Tree. And Vagianos? Yes. I move the clerk read ordinance 3997 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of ordinance 3997? An ordinance of the Village of Ridgewood in the County of Bergen, New Jersey, providing for the special assessment of all or a portion of the cost relating to lead service line replacement. The public hearing is now open. Mayor, I do want to note that we do have uh, the entire team from Ridgewood Water uh, who's heading up the lead service line replacement project in case there are any questions from either the public or from the Village Council. Cynthia Lillis at 577 Windermere Avenue. Cynthia, if you could speak into the mic. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. So I do see that my home is one of those. I'm very lucky to have a 1920s Ridgewood home that seems to have galvanized pipes going into my home. So I have a very particular situation in that I am a senior and I am on a fixed income. So I do have some very serious concerns about the cost to me of what might come down here. And what I'd like to know is, 
how will further information be disseminated? How will I find out everything I need to know about you know, personal cost in this project? Michael. Um, we're at the start of the campaign and going through the- Excuse me, Mike, if you could oh, speak into the microphone, yes. thank you. Uh, so we're at the start of the campaign of communicating out some of these messages. So the exact costs are associated with a, a lot of different factors and in order, to, we have to first find out how many people are looking to opt into the program to get some of those costs. So as we go through the first sta the stage we're in right now where we are proposing the ordinances throughout the four towns and then when we go into the opt-in, opt-out period, we will be disseminating more information at different stages along the way. But until we know how many people are actually into that opt-in or opt-out stage, we, don't have, we can't provide any of that information because there's some contingent upon that number of people and how the costs split. Okay, and I understand that you do have the option to do nothing at this point, but then at what time would you be required to change the service into your home? That is one of the three options you have available, um, but you are correct. We don't know how the laws will evolve as we move forward. So, so there's just a lot more information to be forthcoming yeah. before I can know anything really about how this might have an impact on me personally. I recognize that I'm probably in a unique situation in this regard, but I mean, obviously it is going to be extremely important to me. I mean, as a senior, you know, I've lived in this town for 38 years. I love Ridgewood. I have really a great desire to remain here, but with each additional cost that is levied, it becomes more and more difficult to see that as a future option. So that matters greatly to me personally. Yep. So I will and, look and, forward. And, that, and that's one of the reasons that it's so important that all of the customers who were um, sent these letters respond okay. because that's gonna be the key uh, to be able to frame out the program and do the estimates on the cost so that we can relay that information back right. to the customers. Right, because that could really make the difference you know, between remaining in this community I mean, it really is that significant. Sure. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want a lozenger? Do you want a lozenger? I'm checking to see if I have a lozenge too, for you. Yep. I'm sorry. No, I'm That's checking to see. <laughs> you heard me ask. I have a lozenge. Do you want a lozenger? Because you sound so hoarse. <laughs> no, uh, okay. My family is just getting over the flu. Okay. Yeah. So it's been a rough week, but we are on the mend, and we have tested negative for everything. So if you want one, I have one. I just felt like your voice was getting weaker. Uh -huh. Thank and you. And Mike, we appreciate it. your being here. Obviously, you don't feel great, and we also appreciate the common courtesy of having a mask on, uh -huh. so that others don't get ill. Uh -huh. So, Happy Rohan. To. Rohan De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. Thank you for all of this work that y'all are doing. Um, I am concerned about, um, I don't know enough, but we too are on a fixed income, we will be on a fixed income soon. And it should be a concern for everybody, including the dais, that uh, costs be kept to a minimum and that we do intend on living on Ridgewood, in Ridgewood, unless we're forcibly removed by cost. So please consider that in everything y'all do and say. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I move the public hearing be closed. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. I move that Ordinance 3997 be adopted on second reading and final publication as required by law. Second. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Yes. Council Member Reynolds. Yes. Council Member Weitz. Yes. Council Member Winograd. Yes. And Mayor Vagiano. Yes. Uh, the following resolutions, number 24-121 through 24-144, are to be adopted by a consent agenda with one vote by the Village Council. Each resolution will be read by title only. Award sole source contract, 
purchase of effluent pump and discharge pressure switch, award sole source contract risk management tools for public safety and New Jersey State Association of Chiefs of Police, accreditation services, maintenance of policies and procedures, and mandated training for New Jersey police licensure. Title 59 approval and award contract for 2024 road resurfacing and repairs <coughs> various village streets. Title 59 approval and award contract for NJDOT Municipal Aid North Monroe Street resurfacing. Title 59 approval and award contract for horticultural supplies, parks and recreation. Title 59 approval and award contract irrigation system services, parks and recreation. Award contract under state contract, ammunition, police department. Award contract under Bergen County contract, purchase of equipment, service, and licenses, access control, and closed circuit TV, police department. Award contract under source well cooperative purchasing program, leasing of police vehicles. Award professional services contract, extra work, scope of services for safe routes to school design, assistance to address stormwater management rules. Award professional services contract, administrative agent for affordable housing. Award professional services contract, NJDEP, SHPO response package and independent field analysis, Shed Shedler property. Award professional services contract, should be supplemental archeological phase 1B study, Richard Grubb and Associates. Authorize application to N New Jersey State Historic Trust Grant, rehabilitation of pedestrian tunnel at Ridgewood train station matching funds. Accept name change of vendor for Polaris utility terrain vehicles. Authorize refund of tax over overpayment, 854 Auburn Avenue. Nomination of village owned trees for NJDEP Forest Service Big Tree Program. Acknowledge installation of two small node telecommunication low power antennas, Verizon Wireless. Accept donation, upgrades, renovations to various municipal baseball, softball fields. Endorse Slow Mo May in Ridgewood. So moved. That was second. <laughs> okay. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Yes. Council Member Reynolds. Yes. Council Member Weitz. Yes. Uh, Council Member Winograd. Sure. I, I do want to highlight, because there's people who have advocated for this, th this will move the sugar maple, amongst other trees, through to nomination. So that's kind of exciting that the big tree program has been launched and that tree is now on this list. So, yes. And Mayor Vagianos. Yes. Okay, the following resolution, number 24-145, will be considered separately and read in full. 24-145, establish 2024 dates for dining corrals. Whereas the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood wishes to reinstate a program of dining corrals for patrons whereby eateries are permitted to extend the dining area into the parking spaces on the street in front of their eateries through the use of barricades. And whereas the Village Council has unanimously agreed to establish a fee for the dining corrals at $300 per parking space per month which is payable to the Village of Ridgewood no later than the 10th of each month. And whereas the majority of the Village Council members have agreed that the dining corral shall begin no earlier than May 1st and shall end no later than October 31st. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood that dining corrals in the Central Business District may begin May 1, 2024, contingent upon the paving of the Central Business District streets being completed and extend through October 31, 2024. And be it further resolved that the Chief Financial Officer of the v Village of Ridgewood be and he is hereby directed and authorized to notify the participating eateries of the fees which must be paid to the Village in order to participate in the Dining Corral program. Payment shall be due no later than the 10th of, the m of, the tenth of each month here and after due date for payment of monthly fees and be it finally resolved that any owners of eateries who sign up for the dining corral program and do not pay the dining corral fee by the due date each month shall lose the ability to utilize a dining corral in front of their eatery for the remainder of the 2024 permitted season. So moved. Second. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Yes. Council Member Reynolds. So I just want to say that these dining corrals were created during COVID. And at that point, 
they were a great thing. Restaurants could not have people in them or, you know, 10%, 25%, 50%, whatever. Um, I'm not totally opposed to dining corrals, but I am opposed for a six month period. I truly feel that in the months of July and August, at least last year, I very rarely saw people in the dining corrals except for a Friday night, a Saturday night. And the rest of the week or month, the corrals are empty. They're ugly in my opinion. They take up the street parking spots, which are, you know, premier. And I think that if we did two months in the spring, if we did like mid-April to mid-June and September and October, it would be a little bit of excitement, you know, an incentive to go out on a beautiful spring day. I really don't think that having them there for six months is a good idea. And I truly don't think that July and August people utilize them except for maybe on a Friday or a Saturday night. So I would rather, you know, I'm going to vote no. I would rather only see them for snippets of time and then me, pay, people might get excited to go and, and dine. Whereas if they're there for six months, it, it's not exciting and I, I feel like Last year, the pedestrian mall kind of gave us an insight as to, you know, people needed it during COVID. They desired it. But now, I think the bloom has worn off the rose, as they say. And so I vote no. Okay, Council Member Whites. So I'm going to vote yes, and, and I have a great respect for Councilwoman Reynolds' comments. Um, I mean, to me, it's an issue of safety. It's that if we're going to expect folks to invest the money and expect the village to put in these very large, heavy blockades to make sure that our, our diners are safe, we can't just move them and then put them back, move them, put them back, move them, and put them back. Uh, we need to establish them. I think it's also a safety issue for drivers uh, who may not know when they're there and when they're not there. Um, and listen, if ultimately the need is not there and, and businesses don't want them, then we won't do it again next year. But from a pragmatic standpoint, and especially raising the issue, I mean, it's April. We're supposed to get these things next month. Um, to raise the issue now, potentially moving them back and forth, given, um, the, to me, the serious safety concerns, because these have to be big and bulky, I, I don't think it's pragmatic. I don't think it's feasible. Our business community wants them. I know our residents love them. Um, if ultimately there's another option, that's great. But I'm not sure why we're having this discussion a month before they're supposed to go down. I vote yes, to be clear. OK. Uh, Council Member Winograd. Sure. Um, so when I used to come and watch these meetings, I always used to question why the prior administration and people who were decision makers would think that they would know the business community better than the business. If this isn't working for the businesses, they're not going to pay the fee. And it, it's, um, you know, I, I respect you and I hear you, Lorraine. I want to tell you that on Monday, did anybody go out and have a drink, a snack, or something in town on Monday? Because when I walked my dog from 4 and then later at 8, the whole entire town on Monday was buzzing. People love eating outdoors. Our businesses love increasing their footprint. We have vacancies still, and anything that we can do to attract more foot traffic and more business to make our town more vibrant we should be doing i'm really excited to vote yes for this you know people say oh i'm in town every day i'm legit in town every day i live two blocks away and i think this is only a good thing um and to evan's point you know it's dangerous to keep moving the objects in and out and back and forth and i think this is awesome and if it doesn't work the people who are going to tell us if it isn't working are the people paying the fee not us yes and Mayor Vagianos. Um, I'm voting yes, and, and again, I completely respect what, what you suggested, Lorraine, and certainly we've seen a lot of things change after COVID that worked great during COVID. Um, uh, Evan raises a bunch of great points, but the big point is, is the one that was raised by Siobhan, which is, believe me when I tell you, um, 
uh, restaurant owners will not pay $300 per parking space per month if this is not worth it to them. If they're not getting people out there. I never said it wasn't worth it to them. It is. If they fill it up on a Friday and Saturday night, no problem. They're making a lot yeah. more than 300 I'm just saying for the rest of us, if it's empty 80% of the time, when it's 95 degrees and humid, I don't want to see, you know, I, I just think it's ugly. Yeah, and, 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 we, and we always talk about, when you say, well, they're going to want to do it because they're making money, we talk about wanting to have a thriving downtown. Um, we have to do the things that help the downtown business owners in order for it to be thriving. And, um, and the truth is that it hasn't been thriving as much as we'd like it to post-COVID. And so, you know, whatever help that we can give our downtown, I think it's important that we do. So that's why I vote yes. Eileen, did you get my vote? I did. Okay. Yeah, I think it's yeah. Got you? Okay, good. <clears throat> and with that, we will move to comments from the public. Rohan De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. Matt, just as a point of order, can the mayor, who is a, a business owner, a restaurant business owner, and a property owner that houses restaurants, should he not recuse himself from this vote? Yeah, we've, we've talked about this before. This was brought up um, when um, uh, the mayor was first brought onto the council and again uh, earlier in, uh, in the year. Uh, the way that the local public uh, ethics law works for elected officials is that as long as they are a member of the group and everybody in that group is being treated the same, they can vote. It's anticipated that an elected official is going to have connections with the town, going to have an interest in, in the town itself, and as long as they're being treated the same as everybody in the same group, and that group in this instance is the central business district, they're permitted to participate and vote on any, any matter. So. Are any other members of the council gaining monetarily from these? I have, I have no idea if anybody, if any member but, is but gaining But he monetary. is, but the but, mayor is. But I just, I just tried to tell you that the local public ethics law uh -huh. says that you can participate if you are a member of, even if you have a financial gain from it, you can participate. Well, could you vote. send that to me, please? Could you send that, outline it, and email it to me? I, 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 I prepared a memo that I read and I shared, and I'll send that over to you. Thank you. Not, not to be confrontational, Mayor, but I think in order for us to move forward positively, that there should, can't be any conflicts of interest. So that's why I raised this issue. And, and, and I respect that completely, Rohan. Yeah, because I know you've recused yourself from other things before, so I just found it odd that in this instance, you did not, so. Yeah, and when, and when I, and, and, uh, and Matt, uh, when, this, when this first arose, I had conversations with Matt. He did um, legal research, and statutorily, as well as in case law, mm -hmm. um, this is not considered a conflict of interest. It's not. So um, I know that he's recused himself uh, Downs Tree Service because he's personal friends with Downs. So he's recused himself on any matter that involves Downs Tree Service in the town. So there Downs does things. a lot. I'm and sorry? Downs does a lot. That's, it, that happens every now and then. Right. But uh, from something like this where everybody in the central business district is treated the same and given the same opportunity, he's allowed to participate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Uh, Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving. Uh, I'd just like to comment or add some additional information to a comment that was made about the illegal dumping that took place in 2020 at 460 West Saddle River Road. Uh, the manager indicated that the, the person was identified and went to court and was issued two summonses. I'd just like to add to the record that one of the summonses was dismissed by the judge. So only one, all, the tr person was only found guilty of one charge, and I believe it was the charge for the April incident. Yeah. 
they, they actually pled guilty. It was a you guilty, pled guilty. It was a guilty, it was a guilty plea. plea. He pled guilty, but the the second summons was dismissed. Yeah, they were probably. So that's were, all I wanted to clarify that there were two summonses issues, but one of the summonses was yeah. dismissed. Yeah. But the individual did plead guilty. It was a technicality that resulted in one of the summonses being dismissed. Thank you. Thank you, Boyd. Um, we, we're in the final. middle of public comment right now, and anyone who has, and, and, and anyone who has not yet spoken still has the opportunity to speak. No, you had an opportunity to speak. May I come back up? Actually, we give everyone one bite at the apple um, uh, every night. Uh, no. Oh, that people can see more than once. Wait, wait. Okay. I, I believe we amended the ordinance that dealt with that some time ago. Let me take a quick look. I, I, I thought it was exactly once at right. the beginning and the same person come back and speak at the end. Yeah. Right. So but think, I know the rules I always been because it's not crowded, maybe we'll time just let him yeah. As, as Rohan, long as there was time. Just We're here. Back. We're going to here. I'm I'm Thank I'm you. relatively certain that it's one bite at the apple in, at, right. at the beginning, one at the end. But by all means. Okay, thank, I just, thank you. I just, but I, I, but I want to I wanna be clear. It's an exception so that when we don't. I understand. Do thank you for the exception. Could, could I just say something? Because this is where it gets confusing for the public. We have three opportunities for public comment. We have initial, like every meeting, has initial public comment, which is three minutes, and final public comment, which is at the end. When we have public hearings inside the meeting, that's the opportunity of the five minutes that's specific to that ordinance. And I just want to say that because the next tomorrow, you know, people will say, hey, what's up with public comment? So from like a civic standpoint, I just want to make sure that, you know, inside the meeting where that five minutes is, it's it's constrained. We didn't have public comment, just so you know, on the dining crowds because that was a resolution and not uh -huh. an ordinance. So I just wanted to explain that because I think it's sometimes helpful and sometimes people get very like on okay. my public comments. This does that make sense? Do you it have any makes, questions? It makes okay. perfect Good. sense. Let's, except that let's move on. Oh well, I just just to clarify, I didn't understand that, and so when I came up, I thought I was speaking to the no, vote. I understand. Cause not Gordon, not final it's comment. Okay. It's fine. I just wanted to make sure. Go ahead. Okay. So Rohan De Silva, five twenty one West Saddle River Road. My in my in the opening comments, I said that um, there was soil at Shedler, I'm not talking about the illegal dumping. I'm talking about all the, all the soil, the ones that were approved by the town and the ones that were illegally dumped by whomever. So all of it, when uh, the village manager addressed it, he said he brought about the illegal dumping and that was reported by the village engineer, I'm, and I'm using positions rather than names so I don't offend anyone by butchering their names. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not talking only about the illegal dumping. I'm talking about all of it. All of it was not done correctly. And the accountability must be enforced, not overlooked, because accountability is a must. So. I heard at some point the village manager say nothing was done in malice and so he's not opening up. It has to be opened up. You have to determine. People hold these positions because of licenses, certifications, whatever else they have. So they are professionals and as such they have to meet, they have to be accountable. Just like all attorneys have to do CLEs, all um, medical prof uh, doctors have to do continuing med medical education. So that's it. Anything else? Do we have anybody else? Do we have anybody else? No, no one else. Okay. Is there anything else, Rohan? No, no, I didn't know whether. No, no I don't we're know good. if we have anybody else online. Should, did, no. Hang on. Yeah, it, well, well, yeah, good. And we do have someone who just came online, uh, Mr. Hallaby. 
You have the potential opportunity to wrap up the evening. Uh, well, for, for good news. Uh, your, your address, please. Uh, Rurik Holloway, 1 Franklin Avenue. And l let's have some good news. Uh, Cindy and I went up to have a nickel. And boy, oh boy, does that look good. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Nancy, for tearing down the horrible, horrible barn. And I can't wait to see when the uh, shelters uh, get built. So congratulations. And it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rurik. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'm going to close public comment. And we'll now entertain a resolution. Hold, could, could oh, I, I'm, me. I'm sorry. Beg I your just, pardon. Don't I'm just going to say it, and I'm going to say it again, and again, and again. So Rohan, I, want to, I, I feel your frustration, and I don't like feeling that. There are two separate issues. I'm going to use the word dirt at Havernick, uh, at Shedler. I'm sorry, it's late, and I've had like kind of a week. The berm, which you know, no one on this council knew. That's not, you know, a defense mechanism. It's a statement of fact because, you know, there's different times here. The berm was built prior to us. During the time that it came over, due diligence was done. Our engineering staff tested it. There were six different pieces. It went in there. We have a highly technical, great department. So that, that was done. It went into the berm. At some point during this Shedler discussion, a resident um, had questions about that and called that berm into question. And the DEP came back and they said, and they let all of us know there were six sites, to which none of us knew that before, and we were like, wow. And their analysis wanted further technical information that we don't have the skill sets here. And even in our lovely engineering department, they didn't. It's highly specialized soil testing. At that point, we, in a responsive way, because we are holding people accountable, we engaged in a contract with a third party that does that testing. And I've gotten it wrong, so don't judge me tomorrow. I think it's 35,000 ish to pay a company called Matrix, and I remember that because of, I'm not gonna say it, but I made a joke with Kate, <laughs> a little kid, whatever. We are in the process of testing that soil. Last week's meeting, I said the same thing, I'm gonna keep saying it. Because of the excessive rain, that soil needs to be dry in order for that company named Matrix to take it out and test it. The excessive rain has delayed the testing. They're going to do that. That's cool. Shippo knows it. The public knows it. Until we get those test results back, we can't respond because we don't have any additive information. We know as much as we've disclosed to the public, and the next place where we'll be able to respond is after that third party highly technical company comes in and gives us the results. Additionally, the full council until February when a statement was made regarding some Oprah that was pulled that I can't find still, but I did get the police reports, there was this police issue. And now I'm definitely not going to say too much because when the police get involved, I never know what I'm allowed to know, not know. There, Keith and Matt brought you up to speed on that illegal dumping. Until February, we had never even heard of this or been notified again. We are running two parallel paths to talk about the berm. And until Matrix comes back, nobody up here can say anything. And until we talk in closed session and Matt tells us what we can say, we can't say anything about the other stuff. We're aware of both issues, and we are addressing them. We are addressing them. We spent $35,000 of taxpayer money, and we're going to get information. But at no point even under the prior administration, did anybody shirk the responsibility with the testing? The resident inquiry called it back into question, and we're reviewing it. So I hope that helps. And I'm sorry to my council, because everyone's like, please stop talking because it's late. But I do hear your frustration, and I want to respond. So sorry to my council. Um, we all need a snack, and I didn't bring any. And so <laughs> I hope that helps. Wait, you're still talking, and you didn't bring a snack? <laughs> I have some lozenges that I've been looking at. And with that, we will entertain a resolution to go into closed session. So moved. Be it resolved by the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood that the Village Council meet in closed session on April 10, 2020, 
four at 7.30 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter on the agenda can be reached, and that said closed session will be held in the caucus room of Ridgewood Village Hall, 131 North Maple Avenue, Ridgewood, New Jersey. And be it further resolved that the matters to be discussed in closed session is limited to legal contract negotiations and personnel manager's office. These matters are allowable under NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 12 at SEC. And be it further resolved that the minutes of this meeting shall be made available to the general public when such matters have been deemed completed by resolution of the Village Council. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes.